All right, we're gonna let people join for a moment and then we'll go ahead and get started in just a minute. All right, give it just a, another few moments. All right, I see it leveling off, but we'll give it another Second, oops. All right, but it seems to have evened a bit. We can get started and I'm sure people will continue filling in over the first um, couple of minutes or so. Okay, great. Thanks, Katie. Sure thing. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, June roundtable. Um, I think we have a good program here, um, Arbitrage Stories and Reality, uh, Surviving a, an IRS Audit. And uh, although it says management leadership in, in government, I think uh, we're gonna veer slightly um, in relation to prevailing wage and some other uh, recent developments um, by Sean Canning and Frank Bestone. Felt that would be a little bit better this time around. So un unfortunately for all of you, uh, John Reinhardt and John Mooney are not able to uh, to join us today and you're stuck with me. Um, but I, I hope we uh, were able to give you some good information and you guys uh, enjoyed this presentation. I uh, wanted to remind everyone again that this is a, a round table. Please pose questions. Please put things in the in the chat. We'll be happy to to try and address whatever questions uh, or comments you guys have. Um, we're always better when we have more people contribute. So I'll, I'll get right into it. Um, Scott Gordon uh, is a senior management with Integrity Public Finance Consulting. Scott is a 20 year veteran arbitrage rebate practitioner. He joined Ernst & Young arbitrage, arbitrage Practice in 2004, working as a staff consultant and senior consultant at ENY. In these roles, he completed technical training, performed hundreds of computations, gaining valuable experience and expertise. Scott joined the practice uh, at Integrity on December 1st of 2006. He was promoted to the role of manager in July 2010 and senior manager in 2023. He currently serves as senior manager and project director for a wide variety of clients, having now performed thousands of computations. Scott received a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the University of Florida in 2001. He is listed in the Bond Buyers Municipal Marketplace and is a member of the Florida Government Finance Officers Association. His uh, presentation will provide a basic knowledge of arbitrage, why the arbitrage regulations were enacted, and how they affect all tax-exempt transactions, the types of funds included in arbitrage calculations, differences between arbitrage rebate and yield restrictions, when calculations are required, and how arbitrage payments may be avoided by the application of certain exceptions or securities available. Thanks, Scott. You're up. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Uh, Katie, would you mind uh, going to the first slide, please? Yes, will do. Uh, while she's getting that ready, just uh, a little bit more of a, a a little bit of background regarding myself. Um, uh, like was mentioned in the bio, I started at Ernst and Young. Uh, fortunately, I was only with ENY for two years because ENY decided to uh, get out of the practice because there were just a lot of independence issues, and we spent so much time identifying whether or not we could do the rebate work um, with uh, audit issues. So uh, we wound up forming our own practice, the ENY group did, 
uh, and we formed up with a um, public finance law firm here in the state of Florida. And so I've been working with my boss at ENY since since that time. So it was a very pretty seamless transition, and uh, we, you know, retained all of our clients and um, have enjoyed working um, uh, in this arena for for a number of years. So um, I hope. Uh, Hope you uh, enjoy the presentation and learn a little bit more about arbitrage. And uh, like uh, Bud mentioned, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to um, pipe up and and ask and just stop me at uh, at any time. Happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we'll just talk about arbitrage in general. Uh, and what it is. So basically arbitrage um, is the, the difference between the borrowing rate on your bonds or tax exempt issue uh, and the taxable rate on the investments that those proceeds are invested in. Um, so Arbitrage essentially covers any tax exempt debt. So it isn't just bonds. It's whenever you issue bans uh, and you have rolling bans, um, all of those individual transactions are subject to rebate. Um, if you have TANs, RANs, bank loans, um, certificates of participation, um, uh, letters of credit, capital leases, commercial paper. Um, back in the day in 2009, 2010, um, BABS. Gordon, I think you're frozen. Yeah, I think he froze. Let's see. Oh, looks like he's rejoining. Yeah, there we go. Always something. Oh. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no worries. No problem. Technical Let me... difficulties. No um, worries. Let me reshare. So, um, yeah, just just going back to um, the the types of transactions that are associated with arbitrage rebates. Um, I'm not sure what everybody caught, but. Um, Basically, anything that's tax ex a tax exempt transaction is subject to rebate. Um, all of those items are aden identified below. Uh, so, you know, if you have a capital lease, Build America bond, uh, any of those types of transactions are subject to rebate. And, like, especially you can run into issues whenever you're talking about bands because they have such short time frames, um, and you have a certain amount of time to complete the trend, the calculation after the bonds or after the band matures, um, just something to be aware of. Um, uh, so you can see at the bottom, you know, the excess earnings, are positive arbitrage and those monies are rebated back to the IRS. I know whenever we think of rebate, we think of, oh, hey, we're, we're getting money. But in this case, the entity that's getting money is the IRS. So it's uh, it's a little bit tricky the way that the IRS is. So um, anyway, uh, next slide, please, Katie. So uh, I wanna back up just a little bit little bit and kind of identify why arbitrage why arbitrage exists and why we have regulations as a result of arbitrage 
So um, the arbitrage regulations, they actually started before 1986, but it, it was really kind of a hodgepodge of the, the service identifying key issues that were happening in the marketplace and essentially shutting them down if they felt like the transactions were um, problematic and that the taxpayer was taken advantage of. Um, so uh, the regulations essentially started because of good old, you know, old fashioned American ingenuity. Um, essentially, you know, uh, borrowers, you know, sometimes they would borrow more money than they needed or they might borrow funds sooner than they needed. They might say, okay, we're gonna build, you know, we're gonna build a new convention center or a new city hall, um, but we're probably gonna do that two or three years down the road. But because rates are really, really good right now, we're gonna go ahead and borrow and then we're just gonna, we're just gonna sit on those monies and invest them. And then whenever we need to build the project, we'll go ahead and build the project. Um, and then also um, that trans translated to borrowing longer than you needed to as well. And the IRS felt like it was essentially a burdening on the taxpayer uh, for entities to issue tax exempt debt um, for a longer, essentially a longer period than, than they needed to because uh, it was costing the taxpayer more money to do that, even though maybe the county or the township or borough may be benefiting financially. Um, it was, uh, they felt like it just, you know, it, it wasn't um, a, a reasonable transaction. So they, so they started issuing regulations in 1986, uh, then again in 89, 92, and then the majority, almost all, and I would say 95% of the, the current regulations that we use now relate to the 1993 regulations. And we've been using those, you know, for, you know, basically 30 years now. So um, the IRS, you know, essentially identified the tax exempt the bonds as, or felt, feel like the tax exempt bonds is, you know, it's a benefit to the borrower to be able to borrow at a lower rate than they would be able to otherwise on the open market. And as a result, they felt like regulations needed to be put in place because it was, you know, essentially they call it a privilege to, to be able to um, issue uh, at lower, lower rates, which, you know, costs the, municipality less less funds um and ultimately there is um could could potentially be pretty extreme penalties for not remaining in compliance with these regulations uh throughout the life of the particular bond issue um ultimately the worst case scenario is that the bonds that you the tax exempt bonds that you issued could be declared taxable. And the IRS really doesn't want to do that because that creates a lot of problems, um, not only for the issuer, but it also creates a lot of problems for those bondholders that filed their taxes over the last several years that were investing in tax exempt uh, securities. And now those securities are taxable and they have to go back and they have to readjust their taxes and then they wind up suing whoever you know they 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 got those those securities from uh and so it's just it, it's a big mess ultimately what ultimately winds up happening is usually there will be a settlement between the borrower i mean the the issuer and the service um uh, and we can we'll talk a little bit about that toward the end of the presentation but um that's kind of where the the regs came from and and why we where we are where we are and why we are why we are there now so uh next Excuse slide me. kitty yes sir uh, scott are, are you familiar with any instances where the irs declared uh, a 
tax exempt borrowing to be taxable? Oh yeah, it happens. It happens. Um, uh, it, there, it, there's usually articles about them in the bond buyer, um, on a, it, like I said, it doesn't happen a lot. Like I know over the last couple of years, there were some issues, um, not in the state of, I don't think in the state of New Jersey, I, I want to say they were, um, I want to say maybe either in the Midwest or the, uh, central, um, where there were some issues with prison bonds and, uh, whether or not those issues were even uh, allowable as tax exempt uh, related transactions. And so, I mean, it, it, it definitely happens, but it doesn't happen a lot. I mean, I haven't personally had an issue with any of my clients where we're known of any instances um, personally with any clients that I've ever been associated with that, have had bonds declared taxable, uh, but it but it definitely happens. And usually, when it does, it's it it's kind of uh, it's it's more of a big deal, and it and it, it'll usually be in the bond buyer uh, identified there. So, thanks for the question. Bob. Thank you. Uh, next slide. So, um, arbitrage requirements. It looks like. Uh, there's a question at the bottom of yeah I was just I was going to hold that but uh, uh, sure there was a yep. question about whether the slide presentations would would be available to the uh, participants when the um, uh, session is over and Katie I think you you normally send them out to everyone with their certificates I think yeah usually with the recording um, as long as the presenters are okay with it we'll send um, copies of the presentations we can get a pdf copy and then dana will do the the um, certificates and the credits but yes we can get copies of the presentation if if um scott's okay with it yeah that's fine just for the, just for the participants that's fine yep so um when do you have to do arbitrage review calculations um the IRS uh, regulates that the calculations have to be done every fifth bond year and then at the final maturity date of the issue. So um, if you have a, you know, typically, you know, you'll have a 30 year maturity issue. So, you know, you'll wind up doing the calculations, you know, several times uh, either either before it gets refunded, that, that's what happens a lot of times, like that 30 year issue ultimately winds up getting refunded at some point. So, but every fifth year you have to do a rebate calculation at a minimum. And then um, whenever the bonds are, or whether or not they're refunded uh, or defeased, whenever that final redemption is of the last outstanding bond or note, or whatever the type transaction it is, uh, is, is redeemed, then a final calculation is due within 60 days of that point. And it's due within 60 days of each fifth bond year as well. Um, if there is a, uh, a, a rebate payment that's due or a yield reduction payment that's due at, at that fifth year or 10 year date or whatever it is, um, 90% of the amount that has accrued through that date is actually due to the IRS. So simplistically, you know, if, if there was a hundred thousand dollar rebate, uh, amount due, then you would have to pay 90,000 of that at the five year date. And then you just keep paying 90% of what's due until the final maturity when you have to settle up and pay the 100%. Obviously you're taking into account, the 90%, the 90% amounts that you've already paid, um, you know, as you're, as you're, if you're going forward. Um, but the, the key here um, is that the calculation needs to be done within 60 days of that date. And if it isn't, then you start accruing late interest and you have to not only pay um, the rebate amount or yield restriction amount that's due, but you also have to pay late interest from when it was due until the time you actually pay 
uh, and then you have to write a letter to the IRS saying why you're late and it, it's just better avoid it altogether. Just, you know, get it done on time. If you have a payment, get it submitted and just, just move on. Cause it's, uh, it's actually really a good thing. Um, I know politically it might not be as easy to sell whenever you're having to make a payment to the IRS, but it really is a good thing. Um, uh, from your, you know, your accounting department or your finance department that they've maximized all that they potentially could, um, and not left any money on the table as far as, as far as investments go. So, um, and, and like I alluded to earlier, you know, non-compliance penalty, you know, ultimately you can wind up having the bonds declared taxable or, um, if, um, if you essentially um, are really late, and let's say the the payment was late, or you hadn't even done a rebate calculation, and the bonds are audited, and there's a payment, then you'll have to then you would likely have to wind up paying the payment and a penalty, which could be uh, you know any fifty percent of the liability that's due. It just kind of depends on what the transaction is, what type of transaction, things of that nature. Um, so, like I said, just better to be avoided in the first place and just pay the 90% that's due and just keep moving forward. Uh, next slide, please, Katie. So, it's, um, what actually is included in the rebate calculation or yield restriction calculation? Um, everybody's pretty much familiar with sale proceeds. You know, those are the monies that are generated from the, the particular transaction that you're uh, entering into. And those monies are received whenever the, the closing occurs, whether it's deposited into your project fund, uh, cost of issuance, debt service, reserve, if you're paying capitalized interest on your, on your, on your bonds. Uh, so, you know, everybody's pretty, pretty familiar with those types of proceeds. Um, another type of proceeds, which everybody uh, I think is, is pretty familiar with as well are investment proceeds. And, and those are proceeds that are earnings generated from the, from the sale proceeds. Um, so the interest that you're earning on your investments, um, while they're sitting in the bank before you're allocating those monies to you know, capital expenditures of whatever ordinance you're, you're working on. Uh, the next type of proceeds that I like to talk about is transfer proceeds. And this is probably the first one where it may catch somebody off guard. Um, this only comes up essentially if there's a refunding transaction. So let's say you had a you were issuing a 2024 bond issue and you were that issue was refunding a 2014 uh, general obligation bond or something like that. Um, if there were proceeds, if there were sale proceeds or investment proceeds related to that refunded issue, whenever the refunding issue pays it off, then those monies that are still outstanding get included in the rebate calculation of the refunding issue. So even though you paid off the old debt, the proceeds associated with that old debt get carried over and picked up in the rebate calculation of the new debt. And those monies have to be followed until they're fully spent. Uh, so it, that, can, that can be a little bit tricky to be able to identify, okay, what, and this comes, this is where kind of, you know, really good record keeping comes in into play where, you know, if you've got a refunding transaction and you've got, you know, multiple issue, multiple different bond issues that, um, they were refunded, uh, and they were all paying certain ordinances, trying to bring forward those monies and identify what those monies are related to the refunding issue can get pretty cumbersome. So tracking those monies, um, just my recommendation to have a different sub fund for each pot of 
bond proceeds that you have and not just dump them all into one. I mean, you can have, obviously you can have them all in, in your, um, and your pool cash account or, or however you do it, but at least like within the GL uh, pro software that you have, at least have separate sub funds so that you can track each individual um, ordinance by particular bond issue so that if it is being refunded, then it, it can be easily identified and know what bond proceeds are pulling forward um, because it, it all has to be tracked. Um, and it's easier to do it from the very beginning versus having to go back and try and decipher what money is related to what, um, especially when you're looking at, you know, with the bigger counties. I mean, you could have a bond issue that, that could have 30 or 40 ordinances associated with it. So it can be, it can be pretty tricky. Um, the, uh, next type of, uh, proceeds, which nobody really thinks about at all. Well, hardly anybody thinks about it, I'll say, are replacement proceeds. And those are proceeds, um, that aren't borrowed. They're, they're monies of, uh, of the borrower or the issuer, however you want to say it. Um, but that have essentially a direct nexus to the issue. So in other words, they're, they're pledged amounts um that are secured by the documents and are required to be on hand i know a lot of uh new Jer jersey clients or a lot of clients that i have up in new jersey don't have reserves uh debt service reserves for each individual issue um but that is generally where i'll see it the most um money will be deposited into reserves or um whenever the bonds are issued to secure and to get, you know, maybe a better credit rating um, on, on the debt. And even though those are monies of the issuer, um, they still, because they're pledged to pay debt service, have to be picked up in the rebate calculation. And um, if they earn positive arbitrage, they, you know, you're still gonna have to make a payment essentially on your own, um, on your own funds. Uh, just because they're, they're, they're pledged monies. Um, the last type of proceeds that I wanted to mention um, are disposition proceeds. Uh, like with all my clients, whenever I do calculations, you know, I'll always ask, um, have you sold any portion of the project that you financed the bond proceeds with? Because uh, say, for example, if you, um, you know, if, if you bought a $10 million, um, let's say parcel of land or something like that, and you were going to build, um, I don't know, some sort of structure on it. And then you wound up selling a portion of that parcel of land that was, that was bought with the bond proceeds, then you would essentially be unspending those proceeds for rebate purposes and, those monies would then the the revenues generated from that sale would be subject to rebate. And if that occurs, you really want to, well, actually before it occurs, you definitely would want to talk to bond council about how to treat those monies because there are time constraints and requirements on what you can do with those monies. And it, it just kind of, it just kind of depends on what the the transaction is and what the scenario is. Uh, and bond council is really the one that you would want to talk to about if something like that is, if you foresee something like that coming up or you have already had something like that coming up and then didn't uh, think about the, um, the monies generated from that sale. Um, so next slide, please. So Scott, the record keeping sounds like it has to be pretty detailed. Um, in order to uh, conform with the uh, IRS requirements for the, the filings. Do you recommend that the issuers uh, follow the minimum, minimum requirement deadlines to perform those calculations? That's a good question, but um, uh, the, uh, just the first part of your, your, your comment there. Yeah. Um, 
actually toward the, the the very end of the presentation, we'll we'll talk about all of the all the required documents that that are required to be kept uh, for for the bond issue. Um, but as far as the second part of that, um, uh, yeah, I definitely would recommend doing calculations more frequently than just the required fifth year analysis uh, for several reasons. Number one, if you get to the fifth year and you have a payment, that payment has to be made within 60 days. And you know, if, if it isn't made within 60 days, then you're paying late interest. Um, but especially for my small, smaller clients, like, you know, I've got quite a few like towns in the state of Florida, you know, if they've got a $75,000 rebate payment and they're not expecting it, that, that can be a serious, serious problem uh, because then they're going to start, you know, running around trying to figure out how they're going to scrounge up $75,000, you know, in 60 days to make that payment. Um, so by doing interim calculations, I mean, I recommend doing interim calculations annually until all the bond proceeds are spent. And then once all the bond proceeds are spent, then you can just do the minimum required, um, you know, at the fifth year and the 10 year. Um, but as long as the proceeds are outstanding, I mean, I'd highly recommend, especially with the environment that we're in now, um, getting ahead of and knowing where you sit for each individual bond issue. That way, if you do have a liability, you can prepare for it, you can budget for it, and there, you know, there won't be any surprises. You'll, you know, you'll have already prepared, uh, you know, whether it's the the CFO, the treasurer, the board, whatever it is. Um, to be prepared for that payment and, and be able to make it financially without a lot of undue stress. And then also um, there are things that you can do um, that have timelines. Like if uh, you realized that you needed to go back and reallocate um, expenditures related to the project because you thought they happened um, that they actually happened faster than what was represented, like in your trust statements or something like that, then there's certain time constraints on when you can do that. And, you know, if we're at, you know, uh, year five and, you know, an expenditure happened, you know, four years ago, it's likely that you can't go back and, and, and re readjust that. And so, um, yeah, I definitely recommend doing them more frequently while the bond proceeds are outstanding so that you can um, get ahead of the game and then also make any adjustments that, that may need to be made. And then also um, one thing that we'll talk about a little bit later on in the presentation is um, whether or not you might be able to meet a spending exception uh, and be able to keep any positive arbitrage that you may have earned um, on the bonds. Um, it looks like there's a maybe a question. Yes, um, Stephanie asked, "Is there something, or is this something that Bond Council would help with these types of calculations?" That's a good question. Uh, there are um, a, there are some Bond Councils that that do uh, rebate work. I know a lot of the bigger um, uh, Bond Councils. Um, that we're doing rebate work are no longer doing it. It's it's a pretty niche um, section uh, of the regulations, and um, there's a lot of um, nuance to it. Uh, but y yes, um, a tax attorney certainly would be qualified to do it. But it's just a matter of um, if they would actually be willing to do it, or if they still have a rebate practice. Um, but yeah, um, it, it can be done by, it could potentially be done by your tax, by your tax attorney. Gordon, it also sounds like, you know, doing, um, the calculations in the first few years, you know, could help point out areas where you need to change or improve the record keeping that you you have. Correct. Yep. 
Uh, next slide, please, Katie. Sure, Scott. Before we move on, I'm just going to go ahead and launch our first polling question. Okay. Um, okay. So everyone should see this first question come up now. How many times in the last five years has your tax exempt debt been audited by the IRS? Then you have a couple options there. If anyone has any issues answering the polling questions, please just send me an email. Um, I can put my email in the chat if anyone has an issue. And, and just a reminder, it. we need you guys to answer the polling questions so uh, you can get uh, credit for today's session. Right. I'll leave it open for uh, about a minute and let everyone get their responses in. Thanks, bud. Good point. And then I'll share the results, Scott, so we can see what the audience uh, responded. Thank you. Sure. All right. All right, you should see the results now. Looks like mostly, most people said never, yeah, which is, which is good. Yeah, um, so just, I, I threw that out there. Just um, the reason why I asked that question is because, uh, like I said, I've been doing this for 20 years. And whenever I first started, uh, rates were actually high back in 2004 or five and six, uh, and even some in seven. And then, you know, whenever the housing market crashed in uh, early 2008, I believe it was, rates just dropped off and then they stayed, they stayed really low for, all, I want to say almost 10 years. They, then they jumped up in 2018, 19, and then, you know, they dropped off again in 2020 with COVID. Um, so um, there wasn't a lot of concern for arbitrage rebate until really more recently. Um, and you may have may have seen uh, in the last year, you know, the IRS got a huge influx of money. I think it was 80, uh, 80 like $80 billion um, uh, to basically hire a bunch of new agents. They're training a bunch of new agents uh, to to go in and to, to do audits. So um, if you haven't had an audit before in the past, um, I would be surprised if over the next couple of years um, you get one just because there are so many more agents out there doing more audits. Um, we've definitely seen an, uh, an increase over the last six months of our, some of our clients getting audited. So, um, I mean, it's, it's honestly, it's just a numbers game and a matter of matter of time. So as long as you're prepared, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's really not too painful of a, of a process. Um, as long as you're the IRS agent that you get assigned is, you know, is, is reasonable. Um, next slide, there's, please. There's another question that popped up. Um, does an arbitrage calculation need to be performed after all the bond proceeds have been spent? So there uh, is a great question. Um, I mean, they're they're required to be done each fifth year. Um, if and let's say in between years five and ten, the bond proceeds are already spent. Obviously, the scope of work to do that five year analysis would be greatly diminished, and there would be very little to do. But if the bonds were audited, the auditor would ask for the rebate calculations for those two time periods. Um, so technically, yes. Um, but like I said, the, the scope of work for the, um, you know, the rebate analyst would be small and, and that would obviously reflect in, you know, the fee that you would be having to pay um, for that type of diminished uh, scope engagement. Uh, this is just a, uh, a a very simplistic graph, line graph, so you can kind of see what I was explaining earlier. Um, the The orange line represents the, the rate, and this is, like I said, very simplistic, the rate at which you borrowed, um, you know, over the five-year period, you borrowed at 2%, and you know, initially back in 2019, you were earning a little bit of positive arbitrage 
from you know May to to September. Then obviously you bunch earned a bunch of negative arbitrage uh, from 2019 to 2000 May of 22, and then as you can see the uh, the spread. Uh, between the borrowing rate and the rate that you're earning right now is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a variance. I have, I haven't seen personally in the 20 years I've been doing it, not, not at this big of a, uh, a variance. I mean, cause in 2019 and 20 and even 21, you may have borrowed on a longer or even shorter term issue that, I mean, I've seen bond yields on bands like, you know, 1% or less than 1% and on bonds, 2%. So if you have a 2% yield and you're earning five, 5% on yeah, this graph represents the one year treasury. So, you know, if you're earning 300 basis points above what you're allowed to earn and it's a $50 million bond issue, uh, you could be making a, a very, very big payment um, if, if the proceeds weren't spent quickly, if they were outstanding for the whole five-year period. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we kind of, uh, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, uh, expenditures of proceeds, um, are specifically related to, um, a current outlay of cash. So whenever I do the rebate calculation, I'm essentially looking at when your, um, when your capital expenditure hits your cash balance, not necessarily, you know, when you do the, the PO or when you subscribe for it or, um, but actually when, you know, um, the cash is actually being paid for that particular expenditure, that's when it's getting picked up in the calculation. And I mentioned earlier, there are limitations on, you know, how far back you can go, um, to offset uh, a previous expenditure, um, and especially related to, uh, to, to reimbursements. Um, now there are some reimbursements um, that you can, that don't essentially have a time limit related to like um, preliminary expenditures, which, you know, like whenever you're doing like your architectural design and engineering and uh, you know, they may be doing like um, soil testing and, and things of that nature, those types of expenditures. Uh, you can go back essentially as, as, as far as you need to, but um, for pretty much everything else, there's there's a limitation on how far you can go back. Um, next slide, please. So um, uh, this is a, uh, a very simplistic um, rebate calculation uh, summary um where in 2018 you borrowed 50 million dollars and like i said this is very simplistic there's just one one draw each year um where you draw down the funds to where in 2023 you you've spent all the money you borrowed at four percent but <clears throat> um which is common the uh the return on the investment proceeds uh, in years one and one was, you know, three and uh, 3.75, then 4.25, 4.1, 4.5 and 5% in that last year. So uh, you can see that the $5 million of interest generated a positive arbitrage amount of $93,000. So under that, they, there's a computation credit and the IRS allows um, each issuer or borrower a computation credit for each year because they realize that, you know, the calculation has to be done and it isn't free. They know that it's just not going to be done for free. So they essentially go in and they identify a, a common average of what the expected rebate calculation will cost for each year. And then they adjust that, you know, <clears throat> for inflation on an annual basis. Uh, so in, in 2024, um, the uh, comp credit is $2,070. So it, it's just keep, it just keeps getting more and more. And the good thing about that is it's like, if you have a rebate payment, it's actually, it's literally 
decreasing the amount that you actually have to pay to the IRS. So it's, it's real dollars. Um, so it, it, it decreases that $93,000 that you owe by 9,700 bucks, well, 9,800 bucks essentially. So, um, that's, uh, that is one of the, the positives. Um, if you do actually have to make a payment, it's going to be a little bit less. Um, next slide, please. Sure, Scott. I'm going to do our second poll really quickly. Okay, everyone should see the second question. Uh, when was the last time an arbitrage payment was required to be made to the IRS on your tax exempt debt? And then you have a couple options there. I'll leave it open for a minute and then share the results. And as Bud said, make sure you get your answers in for credit. All right, give it a couple more seconds. Waiting on a couple people, make sure you get your answers in. Okay. Okay, Scott, you should see those uh, responses now. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Nine percent within the last two years. Okay. Well, if you've issued, like I mentioned earlier, if you've issued 2019, 20 deals, um, and you have proceeds that are outstanding, it's it's likely um you you may have either a rebate or yield restriction liability that that's that's due. So just something to keep in mind. Um, but Scott, those numbers of the people who made payments were higher than I was expecting. But I'm happy to see it that that they're well, actually it, doing it. I mean, especially uh, like I was going back to like, um, and they it may have been related to bans, um, you know, short term uh, issues. Um, uh, that would probably be my guess. That's where I've seen a lot of like earlier payments uh, back in 2020 and 21 uh, related to those types of, of, of transactions. So that could be a one possibility. Next slide, please, Katie. So uh, yield restriction, um, th there's two sets of rules uh, in arbitrage. There's rebate and there's yield restriction. Uh, rebate, uh, like I showed in that that previous slide um, that shows the Excel analysis, um, uh, rebate is cumulative from the bond issue date through the final maturity. So any proceed that's subject to rebate or arbitrage during that time is included in the rebate analysis. So everything. Yield restriction is a little bit different. Yield restriction has time constraints and what on when things are picked up in the analysis. The most common, that, and I'll just mention this one, uh, would be like a new money project construction fund money. Like if you're you're going to build, I don't know, a, a new uh, new city hall or new, we'll just say a new city hall. Um, uh, if if those proceeds um, are then invested over the five-year period. Um, overall, they may earn, let's say, going back to that previous slide, you don't have to, but um, you know, in the first few years, you're in negative arbitrage, but then in years four and five, you're in positive arbitrage. Well, the rebate is looking at everything. Well, for yield restriction, um, whenever you're building that new money project like that city hall, it bas they basically want, the IRS wants you to spend that money within three years. And if you don't, at the start of year four, they provide, they require additional hoops that you have to jump through, essentially additional regulation and say, 
from bond year four forward, um, those proceeds are yield restricted. So the first three years of negative arbitrage, if you earn positive in years four and five, you can't offset that first three years of negative arbitrage. So if you overall generated a negative rebate amount, because cumulatively it was negative, even in years four and five, if it was positive, you're gonna to have to make a year reduction payment. So in other words, in years four and five, going back to that, that hypothetical of 2% bond yield, um, if you earned 3% in years four and five, you're having to re you're having to make a yield reduction payment on essentially 1% and we translate that to dollars and that's what you have to pay uh, to the IRS. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Hey, Scott, we had someone um, ask a question. Oh, sure. Uh, they wanted to know of, of those people that had made a rebate payment, um, if any one of them would be willing to um, come on and, and talk about you know, their experience, how they um, decided to, to do the calculation, who did the calculation for them, how they tracked it. Um, if, there, if any one of those people um, would be willing to, uh, to come on, I, Katie, I think you can elevate anyone, I believe, to, uh, to a panelist so they can talk. Is that That's correct? right. Yep. I can either allow someone to talk or bring them up yep, onto the panel. They can get on and, and share a little. Yep. So if anyone would like to, that'd be great. All right. So either identify maybe in a chat or the post the, in the question, if you could identify, you know, would be, be happy to hear your experience. Sure. Let me know about if there's anyone. Um, this next slide essentially um, shows what I was just talking about. And this is, this is the, um, a similar situation to that previous Excel slide. Um, in this case, you know, you still borrowed the $50 million, but the rates are slightly different. Uh, so you can see um, in bond years one, two, and three, um, there was uh, negative arbitrage, but from uh, in the highlighted section, you can see uh, in years four and five, the rates were 4.5% and 5%. So in that bottom section under yield restriction payment computation, the yield restriction is just looking at from 515.21 forward. So during that period, that was the highest return that you had and that generates a positive arbit or a positive yield reduction payment of one hundred and one thousand dollars, and that's actually what's due to be paid to the IRS. Um, and that yield reduction payment will also um, uh, satisfy the the rebate as well. Um, oh. Scott, just so I'm clear, can you explain the difference between a, a rebate and a yield restriction? Well, yeah, I mean, just um, like you're really looking at the top part on the rebate computation. So you're looking at everything. Like I was saying, it's it's from beginning to end. Um, all proceeds are included, whereas with the yield restriction computation, you're really just looking at certain proceeds during certain periods of time. I mean, I sim simplified this um, in regards to a, a new money construction issue, but you could also have other yield restricted funds that may be included in the analysis as well. One really good example might be, you know, an escrow fund or something like that. Uh, if it's a multi-purpose issue, um, you may have uh, an escrow that was, you know, back in the day, advanced refunding escrow. Uh, that may have been included for three or four years in addition to the construction fund monies that would be included. Um, but yeah, it, the, the main difference is what's included and for what time period. Um, and just because you don't have a rebate amount due doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a yield restriction issue. So thanks for the question. Um, are there... Was there uh, any questions down? Let's see. 
We had uh, Elka Yetter is um, from Sussex County, yep. um, paid the arbitrage rebate, and, and she's uh, willing to share her experience. Katie, if you can elevate her. Sure. Should we do it um, at the end of the presentation? I just have to stop sharing um, to get in. Oh, or okay. you want to do it now? We can. It, it's up to you guys. What do you think, Scott? It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Why don't we try it now? Okay. Just give me one sec. So while she's doing that, also, Scott, there's another question posed. How do you know if you have a yield restriction? Uh, well, you have, you have to, like, you, you would have the rebate analyst provide both of those reports, um, both, re both rebate and yield restriction. Um, you would need to be familiar and know what types of, of proceeds are subject to rebate and what are subject to yield restriction. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know if that answered the question or not. I, 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 I think so. Hi, Elka. Hello. How are hey, you? Bud. Good. How are you doing? Good. Thanks. Thanks for volunteering. Uh, no problem. <laughs> So um, I went through a IRS calculation back in a former job and my records were not the way they are now in Sussex County. So I've been on both sides of it. Um, but in Sussex County, we use integrity for our um, rebate calculations. We have uh, separate accounts through our bank. So every time we have a bond sale, we put them in a separate sub account through our um, similar to like an escrow account so that we can track all the spending on each bond and it keeps it set separate so that when we send our information to integrity, they have it all separated out. It makes it a lot easier. Um, and then when we make interest on those accounts, we put them in a reserve for rebate for arbitrage rebate through our capital fund so that that money is available. If we do have an IRS rebate um, and then if the money is not spent, we could, you know, put it back to current fund, any leftover interest. Um, and then we just keep track of our interest rates because it's in a separate fund. So it keeps it all organized. And I think uh, integrity, they, we just send them the information every year and they keep track of it. And uh, this past year, we created a post compliance policy so that we know what information we need and where it's keep, um, where it's being stored so that if the IRS ever did come in, we'd have knowledge of where all the information is. So that's about it. Okay. So what Excellent. made you decide um, to have a, a, an outside professional do the calculation instead of trying to do it yourself? Well, when we had the audit in my former job, it, um, it was a nightmare trying to do everything. <laughs> And we had to hire a tax um, attorney and we were kind of surprised by it because it went back all the way to 2003 and this was like in 2015. So we had to go back that many years and actually find documents. So having a consultant do it every year just makes life easier. And when I um, started my job in Sussex County, they already had an arbitrage consultant. So we just continued with that. So it wasn't really my decision to do it, but it's worked out great and I highly recommend it to anybody who's on the call. Thanks, Elka. You got it. Thanks, Elka. I, you bring up a really good point. And just going back to uh, Bud's question earlier about should we be doing calculations just at the fifth year? Um, another very beneficial thing of doing interim calculations is uh, if you, know that there's a liability, uh, you can set aside those proceeds uh, to make that rebate payment whenever it's due, as opposed to um, spending all the funds and getting to the fifth year and then having to pull $50,000 or whatever the, the, the payment is from, uh, from, some other, from some other source. So um, it's definitely beneficial to be on top of those uh, and doing them more frequently so that if you do have a payment, you can set aside some of those proceeds 
you know, to, to make that, that future payment. Um, uh, so that's definitely a helpful, um, exercise to go through. Katie, can you bring back up, um, Yes. Slide, please. So yeah. thanks for volunteering uh, again, Elka. And yeah, thanks, uh, Elka. It looks like you're going to be with us for the rest of the presentation. So congratulations. It's <laughs> funny. Oh. Yeah, I don't remember what. Uh... Yeah. Uh, so just um, briefly, want to talk about. Um, arbitrage exceptions. Um, uh, there are several types, um, small issuer exception. Um, uh, basically, if you issue um, $5 million, uh, less than $5 million within a calendar year, uh, or up to $5 million within a calendar year, um, you could potentially, your issue could potentially qualify for small issuer exception, so you wouldn't be subject to rebate. <clears throat> The downside to that is it's only applicable to rebate. So if you borrowed say $4 million and you still had a million dollars left at the start of year four, um, then those monies, even though you may have met small issuer would still be subject to yield restriction um, at the start of year four. So you still have to spend that money quickly uh, even if you meet the small issuer exception. Um, there are some spending exceptions uh, that can allow the uh, issuer or borrower to um, retain all the positive arbitrage that they've generated on the issues. Uh, there are three different exceptions. There's a six month exception, an 18 month exception and a 24 month exception. Um, the six month exception is pretty simple. You literally have to spend every dime of the, pro all of the proceeds that you you generated and received within the six month date. The 18 month exception, um, there are benchmarks that have to be met. So you can't just spend all the money by the 18th month. You have to spend 15% at the six month date, 60% at the one year date, and then 100% uh, at the 18 month date. And if you don't meet one of those benchmarks, you are essentially um, unable to qualify for the exception. And then there's the, the two-year exception. And that's really just for a construction fund uh, issues. And that will be something that bond council will identify, hey, this transaction qualifies as a construction issue and could potentially meet the two-year exception. And the same with that, um, <clears throat> there are benchmarks that have to be met and you can see the um, uh, the percentages that have to be met at each six month date. Um, but if, if all of these exceptions or all of the benchmarks are met, then uh, any positive arbitrage that you generated um, on the issue uh, related to the, to the proceeds would be, um, be able to be retained by, uh, by the borrower or the issuer. So um, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good opportunity but it's definitely something that you have to plan for. You, um, you really have to get all your ducks in a row and make sure that um, you know you're you're on top of the project manager that you're paying those bills you know on time uh, so that you can meet each one of those potential benchmarks. Um, so um, definitely possible, uh, good possibility uh, to be able to try and meet that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, kind of already talked about uh, refundings. There's just, you know, really right now we just have current refundings. Uh, the trend, um, advanced refundings are really just specifically related to taxable issues uh, over the last several years. Um, and we've uh, pretty much already touched on transfer proceeds. So uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> this is something that um, John specifically wanted me to bring up during the presentation. Um, uh, and this is, uh, a type of security that people haven't really, or, or may not be aware of, um, uh, slugs are, um, uh, issued by the treasury, um, their state and local government series, uh, securities. 
just call them slugs. Um, and, um, you know, they can essentially be purchased by the issuer, which translates to, you know, the governmental body, um, an entity that issues tax exempt uh, bonds and or and or the conduct borrowers related to those bonds. Um, and this type of uh, subscription is done through SlugSafe. So you have to have a SlugSafe account set up or um, if you're using your trust, if you're doing it through your trustee, which a lot of clients that we have had purchased these types of um, uh, securities have done it through their their, their trust banks. Um, but just something to be aware of, and I mentioned this on the next slide, but not all um, not all banks have access or have accounts already set up. So um, you may have to like shop around and see uh, if your your bank won't do it, see which you know bank near you um, or within the state would you know be willing you know would be willing to do it. Um, but essentially, these these securities were were created to help the borrower or issuer um, uh, be able to um, comply with arbitrage rebate and yield restriction. Um, the first there's there's two types of slugs. There's time deposit slugs, and then there's demand deposit slugs. The first type of slug, the time deposit slugs, I think everybody's familiar with. They just may not have known that's what it was called. So if you have a, a refunding transaction um, in your escrow, it's likely that you may have a type of slug um, that makes up a portion or all of that escrow fund. Um, and these types of um, securities are fixed rate, um, but and they have a set maturity, but those rates and maturities are adjustable based on whatever the need is of the borrower uh, for that particular transaction. So they're they're really uh, they're really beneficial. Um, but usually, whenever you're thinking about that type of transact or that type of security, it's it's related to refundings, pretty much. Um, but the other type of, of slug that people may not be aware of are demand deposit slugs. Uh, you know, historically, they just really haven't been used much. Um, and demand deposit slugs are basically they're, they're short term securities. Uh, they're, they're essentially one day certificates of indebtedness that roll, um, that, that automatically roll until you decide, you know, you, you want to. Um, you want to liquidate um, those monies, um, and so it's it, 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 it it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's kind of it kind of functions like a money market account. Um, but it it, it is still required to you know you still have to make these purchases through Slug Safe or your trustee uh, is going to be making them through through Slug Safe. Um, but they are they are liquid. Um, whereas the time deposit slugs are not um, as liquid. So um, related to the demand deposit slugs, one of the good things about them um, is the liquidity. You know, you can pull that money out uh, within, uh, and, and this is specifically related to the treasury side. If it's less than $10 million, it's one day. And if it's, if it's more than $10 million, it's, it's like a three day business process. But it may be a few more days on top of that, depending on how long it takes your bank to process it as well. So that's something to to consider if you're thinking about and in, you know investing in demand deposit slugs. Uh, the great thing about demand deposit slugs, though, is they're exempt from rebate and yield restriction, um, whereas time deposit slugs, the ones above, are not. Uh, they are subject to arbitrage rebate and yield restriction, but the demand deposit slugs are not. Um, and it has to do with the technical way that they're defined, that they're not um, a, they're not investments, uh, they're not investment property. Um, but um, ultimately what it boils down to is they're great because you could potentially um, Earn positive arbitrage and keep it if you're ex if you're if you are invested in a demand deposit slug, 
Um, next slide, please. Um, there are some there are some some downsides in um, in the sense that, and this is a lot more related to the time deposit slugs. Like uh, whenever there's an issue with the debt ceiling, and they're uh, they're ha they have a real concern for whether or not they're going to you know uh, reach the debt ceiling. They may do what they call, uh, and historically they do um, close um, the slug window. So during that time period you can't buy slugs. So if you were anticipating buying a slug and the slug window is closed, you're gonna have to go some alternate route. Um, now that's related to the time deposits. If you've got money in a demand deposit slug and the slug window closes, the treasury is going to convert those time deposit slugs into these, what they call special 90 day certificates of indebtedness. And those certificates of indebtedness will continue to roll until that slug window opens. And then you have an opportunity to decide what you want to do. You can either keep it, you can sell it, or you can roll it back into the demand deposit slugs. They, they leave it essentially up to you. Um, but um, it's a, you know, historically it hasn't been used a lot because um, just because of the way that the yield curve has been uh, historically. Um, I mean, you're roughly getting about 80% of what taxable securities are getting, but because of the way the yield curve is with the borrowing rates, currently um, you could potentially have um, uh, generate positive arbitrage on the demand deposit slugs and, and keep those keep those monies. So that's a um, potential uh, benefit uh, for those that, that are investing in, in demand deposit slugs. Um, uh, uh, next slide, please. Scott. Yes. Sir. So uh, I'm not familiar with uh, the demand deposit slugs. So do you have any additional advice for people interested in uh, pursuing them? Well, just um, like I mentioned earlier, just um, it is, I mean, what I would recommend is speaking with your bank. I would not automatically assume that your trustee bank or bank in general has access to slug safe. A lot of people haven't been, haven't been using them historically just because of the way that the yield curve has been. So you may have to shop around uh, to find a bank that, that will be able to do it if you don't want to uh, tackle it yourself. Um, I mean, I, I think you can go in uh, uh, as an issuer and, and create an account through SlugSafe and do it, but you're also taking on, you know, um, the risk of um, doing it yourself as opposed to at least having a trustee that is also going to be looking at it and being aware of it and um, having essentially, you know, a couple of sets of eyes on it um, as you're you're going through and buying and selling those types of of securities, and and then also just the fact that if you do have the slugs, uh, the demand deposit slugs, and you know you have a construction fund that those monies are deposited with, or a portion of those monies, just being aware that even though it's it's one to three days on the treasury side, it could be potentially one to three days or more on the bank side as well. So, you know, if you're needing to pull monies out to pay requisitions uh, or, you know, invoices, things of that nature, um, just be aware of that time constraint and plan accordingly and always anticipate it taking longer than, than what you thought it was going to take, you know, uh, whenever you're trying to get that money um, uh, out. So Scott, you also mentioned the uh, demand deposit slugs could be converted to uh, 90 day certificates when there's a debt ceiling issue. Would yeah, they, it will. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, would those 90 day certificates be subject to the yield rebate restrictions? No, they're, they're, they're still, um, they, they are still um, part of the demand deposit slugs. Um, they're just, they call them special um, 
special uh, certificates of, of indebtedness. Um, so, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and I, I think you had mentioned this earlier as well, but like as far as the requirements, this next slide identifies, uh, you know, what those requirements are. Um, and let me first start off by saying this, this happens a lot. Um, you know, I'll have a lot of clients, especially when I first started working with them, say, you know, we only keep records for five years or for seven years. That's the, you know, the state requirement or something like that. Well, with anything related to a bond issue or, or note or whatever the case may be, you have to keep those records for the life of the issue plus three years. And if it's refunded, you have to keep it for the life of the issue of the refunding issue plus three years. So essentially you have to keep these records forever. So, I mean, I would just, you know, I would just recommend if you've got hard copies, start scanning all that stuff so that, you know, you don't have files and files and files of, of, of hard copies. And, you know, you have easy access to, to those records and can pull them and identify where they are. But, you know, you're looking at transcripts, which are, uh, if any of you have issued a bond issue, you know, you're looking at like a three inch thick black bound binder with 2000 pages of documents that has to be kept. All the bank records, expenditure records, investment records, ledgers, um, uh, records related to the debt service payments, any management contracts related to those particular bonds, the assets that are associated with those bonds. I mean, you basically have to keep a lot of records related to those, those transactions. And on um, several of the um, audit situations that we've had over the last year, the auditor, the IRS auditor has asked not only for the bank records, but for the uh, records identifying what the um, uh, what the expenditure was, when it was paid. Um, you know, it, they're asking for a lot of information. So having that and knowing where it is will save an exorbitant amount of time. In uh, if you're ever in a situation where you have an audit, because for anybody that has had an audit, you know, you only have 30 days or 20 days to respond to that audit um, before the auditor is calling you back and saying, where's this information? And, you know, and so it's, um, it can be a real um, uh, resource um, uh, problem. Like if you're having to like bring all this stuff together um, and man hours or hours just in general uh, to, to be able to comply and provide all the information needed for that particular transaction. So uh, having this um, easily accessible is, is, is definitely key. Uh, next slide. Sure, Scott. I'm just going to do a, another one of our polls. I think we had um, two more for you. So this Third question you guys should see now, how many of your tax exempt bond issues have bond proceeds outstanding beyond three years? And I'll leave it open for a minute and then share the results. Give it another second. All right. Okay, you should see those results now. Good mix in there. So 
uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and that just goes back to what I was asking earlier, you know, I mean, if you've or mentioning earlier, as far as the, you know, 2019, 20 bond issues, you know, if you've still got proceeds sitting around, um, and you borrowed it at a low rate, um, there's a very high likelihood that you're going to have either a rebate, um, liability or yield restriction liability. Um, uh, and Elka mentioned uh, this as well. Whenever she was, um, whenever she had an opportunity to speak, um, uh, the IRS, I, I think it was about um, maybe eight or nine years ago, um, really made a push for having um, post issuance compliance policies. I mean, I think historically before that, people. Uh, or issuers, I should say, were relying on the non-arbitrage certificate or tax certificate, whatever the bond council calls it, um, and saying that, you know, this is kind of our post-issuance compliance policy, and this is kind of what we're working to make sure that we're in compliance. But <clears throat> the service really wanted to beef that up and say, you need to have a policy in place, and you need to have people and identify people accountable for what for those processes that you're working to make sure that the bonds uh, that you issue or taxes and debt that you issue remains in compliance. And they also added to the 8038 at that time or 8038G, um, depending, um, you know, do you have a post issuance compliance policy in place? Uh, so that um, initially, whenever they, whenever they really started pushing that, they would, they, they they at first started to say, you know, through the course of, you know, working your policy, if you discover that you've got a problem and you bring it to the IRS, uh, financially, we're going to, you know, we're going to cut you a break. No, I mean, not dissolve it entirely, but, you know, if there's an issue, we're going to be much more lenient as far as what you have to pay out of pocket. But they kind of went away from that after after several years, but it, it is still on the 8038. And I still think it is a very important uh, document and policy to have in place uh, to make sure, especially in that right now with the way that the market is of making sure that your particular uh, debt issues are, are in compliance and, and, and knowing where everything is and, and identifying that. And so that when, I, if you do go through an audit, you're, it's much simpler and it takes a lot less, um, uh, you know, human resource time to, to be able to gather all the information that's needed. If it's, you know, at your, uh, you know, uh, fingertip on our mouse click. So, um, really the only other thing is, uh, you know, um, sometimes situations can't be solved with rebate or yield restriction payments. And so, the IRS came out with this voluntary closing agreement program, uh, wherein an issuer can, you know, say, this is the problem. This is how we're going to address it. Do you agree? And, you know, it's a whole process with the IRS and usually you have bond counsel involved. And, um, so, um, it, it is, um, advantageous in the sense that it can be fixed, but it is more costly because anytime you get bond counsel involved, um, uh, well, I don't want to say that any time, but, uh, whenever you're, you're having them doing the heavy lifting essentially, um, to make this submission to the IRS, um, then it, you know, it can certainly be more, more costly. So, but it is an op option for, um, an issuer that, that runs into a problem or realizes there's a problem and doesn't know exactly how to, how to fix it. Um, next slide, or is that? Is that it? Then it was it. Yep. Great. Yes. That's Thanks, it. Katie. Yep. Thanks, sure Scott. Thing. Yep. Okay. Anybody have any final questions or? Oh, and I, but I will mention. Um, I, when you ask the question about the demand deposit slugs, rolling or converting, whenever the slug window closes, I. I think they're still exempt, but I'll verify that. Um, like, I'm not like the demand deposit slug guru, but I do know a little bit. Uh, and I'm 
definitely learning more as we as we use it more um, or our clients use it more, I should say. But I mean, I think the answer is it's still exempt, but I'll confirm with that. I'll confirm that with with you and then you can respond to um, uh, to those that are participating. Great. Thank you, Scott. Hey, bud, just before we move on from this topic, we had one last poll um, on Scott's topic from John Reinhardt that I'll launch just so that we have the right amount. OK. Um, this last question is, what is the expected benchmark for spending 85% of the bond proceeds? So while people are answering that, uh, Stephanie posed another question. Um, what are the IRS publications related to these topics of arbitrage? Um, I mean, there, there's... Um... There's actually a lot, like if, if you go onto the IRS website, they, they have uh, all kinds of modules that are available. Uh, uh, some of them are very, very good um, regarding rebate yield restriction, um, uh, what they entail. Um, there's also um, private letter rulings uh, that um, identify how um, some more, I guess, esoteric uh, issues are addressed and how they're they're applied, but uh, yeah, you can literally go onto the um, IRS website and um, search, uh, or just you know just Google um, uh, rebate uh, modules, yield restriction modules, IRS, um, and you should be able to get several different uh, different items. And then also you can read. Um, under the Treasury regulations, Section 148 of the Treasury regulations and 148 of the code. That's a, a pretty good place to, to start as well. Okay. I'm sorry, Katie, did you put up the uh, the answer to the poll? Oh, did I not hear the results? Sorry. I was writing some notes. No, no. talking. <laughs> so uh, is, is, is really a question. So um, it's anticipated whenever you issue bonds um, that you are reasonably expecting to spend those monies within three years. So the 36 months would be correct. Um, if there isn't a reasonable expectation for those monies to be spent within three years, then generally, and this this would be something that bond council will get into, but um, if it isn't, then the bonds wouldn't qualify for a temporary period and they would be arbitrage bonds or hedge bonds. Um, and so um, if you have proceeds that are sticking around, um, just try and make sure that you get them spent as 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 quickly as as quickly as possible. Um, but like I said, that's that's a reasonable expectation whenever the bonds are issued. Um, uh, and you know that's something that that bond council is going to go through with you. You know as you're as you're working through through that deal. But that's it. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak to everybody today. And um, I appreciate uh, uh, your help, Bud, and your help, Katie. Thank you so much uh, making this uh, as seamless as possible. Thank you for your time and, and all your good information, Scott. I very much appreciate it. Thank you. OK, so we're going to hop right into uh, Melissa. Uh, Melissa Howard currently serves as the treasurer for the uh, county of Bergen. She has over 16 years of experience in local and county government with a specialization in grants and capital projects. Melissa holds her undergraduate in business administration with a concentration in accounting from Felician College, now Felician University. Uh, she holds a master's of public administration from Fairleigh Dickinson University and possesses both her municipal and county finance officer's license. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. I want to share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So um, I'm here today because about two weeks ago, I guess, give or take, 
Mr. Reinhardt, who is my very nice next door neighbor, um, knocked on my door and said, hey, do you want to do a seminar on how we're surviving our IRS audit? My first response was, who would want to hear a seminar on that? But I am now here today to present how we're going to turn our mess into our message to help people get through an IRS audit. Um, so why most people want to know, why am I being selected for an IRS audit? It's very rare that people do, and especially governments get selected for an IRS audit. But like Mr. Gordon said, now they've hired a lot of IRS agents and these audits are becoming more of a um, an everyday occurrence rather than just a um, once in a while type of thing. So it's important to understand, number one, don't panic when you get an IRS um, notice. Um, it's not an accusation that your organization is doing anything wrong. What the IRS is trying to do basically is to conduct an unbiased review um, of your organization's tax returns to determine the accuracy and compliance with the IRS law. So most of the common triggers of your IRS audits come from errors. So I'm sure everybody on this call has received a notice from the IRS with a fine, especially on their 1099 filings or the 941 filings that there are things that don't match and they have we have to present to them why. So those are things that start to trigger these audits. So math mistakes, filing status errors, uh, filing incorrect tax returns, not signed tax returns, incorrect bank account numbers, or incorrect name and business information for the vendors. So the filing tax errors, especially for individuals, now that we have to file on systems, not by paper, one of the main things is that you need to go back and keep on checking to make sure your file was accepted by the IRS. Because a lot of the times, you submit your file, you think everything's fine, and then you find out that your file was not submitted. So once you submit your file, you should go back a couple of times and just make sure that, number one, it has completed the transaction of, of filing, and number two, that it says that it was accepted. Because if not, then you're going to wind up being late on your filing, which is going to be another issue. Um, so audits are usually done via random selection and computer screening. So what they'll do is they'll send things through a computer generation. They'll set norms. And if you do not meet the norms or if you're or something in your tax return is not meeting the norms, it could trigger the audit. Um, personally, in our case for, for the county, we don't know why the audit was triggered. However, I kind of feel that the audit was triggered because year after year, we do get notices saying that our 1099 file does not match, things that are not file is not matching, they're assessing fines on our 1099 file. So I think after a while, it started to trigger this audit process. The IRS can go back six years for auditing purposes, so that's something else you also, also want to remember. Um, it's important to note that if you have a large organization with multiple email uh, areas where uh, mail gets delivered, because the IRS will only contact you via USPS mail. They will not email you. They will not call you on the phone. They only contact you via mail. And it's very, their letters are very, just very clear of what it, that the, from the IRS. So it's important that if you have multiple mailing addresses, if you're a big um, organization, if you're a big municipality, if you're a big county, or if you're just a, a county municipality or a local agency or business that has multiple mailing addresses, that you inform anybody at those mailing addresses that if something comes in from the IRS, that they please do not ignore the letter. Um, when they send the letter to you, they're going to give you basically a form, a, a, a top form that's going to say that they're conducting a audit on your organization. And behind that form, they're going to, it's going to be um, an IDR request. An IDR request is an information document request. What that document request is, that's the most important thing of your audit. It's going to, that's going to be what they tell you they want your further information on. So it's important to make sure you understand um, those IDR requests. It's also very important, and this is something that John and I learned through this process, is that you have somebody in your organization that is trusted and responsible for making sure they respond to these requests. Because if you don't, you're going to see what happened to us um, when we didn't. Okay. So the initial steps upon receiving the audit notice, make sure you understand the notice. 
take special notice to the dates, the tax years that they're auditing, specific issues and documentations being requested. requested. You wanna pay particular attention to the audit review date and the due dates, because if you miss your due dates, it becomes a whole other issue for you. Um, the next thing that we suggest is that you notify um, proper professionals needed to assist in the review. So we had to call in our payroll, our payroll um, individuals in our payroll department. We had our auditors come in and take a look, at, a look at the notice also to make sure that we, John and I, were not missing anything in that notice. Um, you want to start to begin to get, gather the relevant documents and organize them in the manner of the IDR notice. So the IDR notice is going to be set up in a way where it's going to say number one, and it's going to say payroll documents from XYZ. Number two, 1099 documents from XYZ. You want to make sure that when you're submitting your documents back, you're following that IDR so things are not scrambled because the IRS agents are not kind to go through the documents and try to figure out what you're submitting. They're just going to reject it back and say, submit it to me again. And now you're going to be in noncompliance with the time period. Um, communication and cooperation is very, very important. John and I have became become very acquainted with our IRS agent that is doing our audit. We speak to him frequently. Um, we email with him frequently. When we have an issue, we call him immediately. If we can't find something, if something's delaying us, we always stay in contact with him so that he's on. he understands what we're going through in our process and he becomes a little bit more lenient with us when we ask for something um, that we're just not springing it on him on the, on the last moment. Um, so at the end of the day, um, what's going to happen is they're going to assess you. They're going to assess fines to your organization or not assess fines. So basically, be, be dependent upon what information you're provided them. If the, the information you're provided them to the auditor is sufficient, you will not be assessed a fine. If it's not, you're probably going to be assessed a fine. So if you do not agree with the findings being presented, which we did not the first time we got our, our initial finding from the IRS, you have the right to have a conference with your IRS manager. And that's exactly what we did. We we had a phone conference with our IRS manager and we, we explicitly stated to him that we were not in agreement with what they were trying to fine us for. And then he allowed us, he gave us more IDRs and then those IDRs helped us to clear up some of the fines that we were willing to be assessed. Um, if for some reason you and the IRS agent do not come to um, terms, IRS also offers mediation, so you can file a formal appeal. It will go through a process uh, if it's within the statute of limitations. That's why you can't let this go because you have a statute of limitations for which you can file these items, so you have to make sure you stay on top of them. We have been lucky enough to have an IRS agent that I'm not sure if he's new or, or not, but he is much more understanding than some other people that we've dealt with on the IRS side for other issues. So um, what are the consequences for not responding? So the consequences for not responding are pretty serious. You, have, you can have some serious consequences for not responding. So what they initially do is they can start Collect, collecting the taxes that they feel that they are owed the IRS. So they can start sending uh, fines, penalties, letters to you and asking for those fines. Um, if you ignore their requests to pay their fines, they can, can begin to freeze your bank accounts and your investment accounts, which would be a very big issue for a government agency if they begin to freeze assets. Um, they can file liens on items. And then if it gets to that point, they can begin to begin criminal proceedings against the individuals who do are ignoring um, what they're asking for. So at the end of the day, if the IRS comes knocking, just answer the door because it's going to make it a lot easier for you than just trying to run away and ignore them. Um, so how did the county of Bergen survive and learn from their IRS audit? We were so lucky that in November of 2022, we received a piece of mail from the IRS stating that they were going to audit our payroll and 1099 records for the year of 2020. Yeah, the year of 2020, you know, the year where the whole world shut down. We had a whole bunch of things going on, people working from home, new payroll, new payroll um, requirements. So when we initially got the notice, we were 
me and John both kind of shook our heads. Like of every year they're going to audit, they're going to audit the year that the world shut down. Okay. We were okay with that. We said, uh, this shouldn't, this shouldn't be, this shouldn't be that bad. Not too bad. I think we can get through it. So I want you to kind of watch the PowerPoint presentation and the process that we went through with the IRS and how things change very quickly for non-responsiveness. So the initial request for information that we were sent for, they wanted to do a reconciliation of our payroll W3 from 2020, and they wanted the entire 1099 vendor file for who we paid and who received 1099s. Not too bad, right? That, that shouldn't be too, too bad to give them. Um, for the reconciliation, they wanted us to go from gross to net for Medicare, Social Security, and income tax wages. Pretty simple, not too bad. So John and I said, this is not that bad, of, not that big of a uh, assignment. We assigned it to our payroll account and we assigned it to our accounts payable supervisor because our accounts payable supervisor is in charge of our handling our 1099 files as well as our 1099 filings. Our payroll accountant does all of our 941 filings, works very closely with the payroll department. No problem. So our first IRS audit learning tip is pick a responsible and responsive employee to compile and submit this documentation. And make sure you double check everything prior to submission for completeness and accuracy. So what had happened with us is we had thought that our payroll accountant compiled the information and submitted it to the IRS. He informed us that he could do that. Um, he uploaded it into the IRS portal. They're gonna provide you a portal, a secure portal where everything has to go through being that there's social security numbers and EIN numbers on all of this stuff. So John and I said, okay, good. We didn't hear anything from the IRS from November of 2022. We had 30 days to file. So our first IDR was 30 days. They gave you to file. We filed within that 30 days. Didn't hear anything until May of 2023 when we got a second notice from the IRS and they were threatening to fine the county $55 million in fines and penalties. So after the shock of reading the $55 billion price tag wore off and we like took a breath, John and I got on the phone with the IRS auditor and say, we need an explanation to why this is occurring. We provided you the information that you asked of us and I'm not sure why we're here at this point. Like what, what, why are you trying to find us $55 million? Um, at the time, our IRS agent told us we were in non-compliance and we were a little taken back. He said that the information that was submitted by our payroll accountant was not the information that was requested on the, the um, IDR. And some of the information that was requested from the 1099 file was not submitted. So John and I called in our payroll supervisor, I mean, our payroll accountant, and we called in our um, accounts payable supervisor at the time and our fiscal officer who was assisting on this matter. And we asked them what happened. I thought you said you submitted these things. We asked them for the files. We started to look at the files and we were definitely non-compliant. What they had submitted to the IRS was definitely not what they were asking for. So second IRS uh, surviving an audit tip is the CFO or your treasurer or however you, you're made up in, in your organization, we have a CFO and we have a treasurer here, should be the individuals that are actually submitting the documents to the IRS. Um, it's important that you have, you can have your employees gather the information for you, which you should because they're, they know more where everything is. Um, but it's incredibly important that as the CFO and the treasurer, we realized that we needed to double check that work before it was, um, submitted timely and correctly. So our first mistake is that we thought that we underestimated the IRS's re request. We thought when we saw it, hey, this couldn't be that hard to do. It's simple information. We have in the information at our fingertips, we submit it, come to find out that that information wasn't at our, at our fingertips as we thought. So number two is make sure you, you are, whoever is in charge in your organization is really reviewing these things before they're submitted. Hey, Melissa, I'm yeah. just going to cut in and do our first sure. polling question for your topic. Sure. Um, okay. Okay, everyone should see the first polling question for Melissa's topic. When the IRS sends you an IDR, what is the first thing you should do? I'll leave it open and then share the results in a few seconds.
Okay. You should see the results now. I'm funny. So you Thanks. you can you can call them and make sure that the, the the document is real. There's usually a phone number on there. But the first thing I would do is start to assign a staff person to us to start compiling this information. Um, if you, that would be your first part because you have 30 days to do this, and talking to the IRS agent on the phone is not going to extend your 30 days. So I would start to assign somebody to go in and start collecting this data for you as you're trying to figure out the other side of it. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. So our last IDR request was May of 2023 when they tried to fine us $55 million. We got on the phone with our agent. They gave us a second chance. Well, here's our second chance. In July of 2023, we got a new IDR request received by the IRS agent. So what noncompliance did for us is expand the scope of our audit. So our audit went from a reconcile, reconciliation of the payroll W-3 and the 1099 forms to every single item that you see on your screen right now. So not only did we have to provide them again, everything from the original request, but now they were questioning county-owned vehicles that were taken home in 2020, uniform and, and clothing provided to employees, a list of all employees receiving automobile allowances and reimbursements, mileage rates for the and policies for those employees, literature on how we um, how we educate our new employees on employee benefits, section 125 cafeteria plan documentation, written policies for all of the following items, account accountable and not accountable plans, automobile allowances and reimbursements, travel allowances and reimbursements, entertainment allowances and reimbursements, meal allowances and reimbursements, tuition reimbursements, health club, so basically every fringe every fringe benefit that we give to our employees, they wanted a policy on. It continues. Hold on. I might. The IR the IDR request for July 23 continues. They also wanted government P cards to now. They wanted to see the list of employees with the P cards, what the P cards were being used for. We need they needed monthly credit statements for every single month for the month for the year of 2020. For the 1099 request, we now had were um, subject to obtaining a four six uh, form four six six nine from all the vendors provided on the IRS list, approximately 111 vendors. So here's a little important information that we've learned from the form four six six nine request. It's important to note that vendors are not required to provide you this form. You can ask for it, but if they don't want to provide it to you, they don't have to provide it to you, and their non-compliance in providing you that form results in you having to pay that fine. So um, we had a lot of vendors when we gave them this form that were very, very uncooperative with providing this back to us. Um, it came to the point where we eventually had to start threatening our vendors that we do business with still, that we were going to um, inactivate their vendor number until they comply. We weren't gonna pay them anything further until they complied. That's great for the vendors that um, you work with still, but there may be people from 2020 on that list that you no longer work with. Don't forget that was a COVID year. So you might've had people on that list that were just paid during COVID. Like we hired a vendor during COVID to do something very specific during that period of time. So you don't really have um, anything to get them on, right? They don't have to provide the form. And you don't have any way of making them provide the form. So you're basically out, going to be paying the fine on that. On that, So the IRS requires us to pay 24% of whatever we paid out as the fine. So whatever we paid that vendor, they assess a 24% on that payment as the fine. Um, so this process went back and forth, back and forth with the vendors, back and forth with the IRS. Um, we're still in this process right now. Um, unfortunately. So my third IRS audit learning tip is make sure that um, preparation is the key. Make sure your, all your documents are compiled, accurate, submitted timely to the IRS, and failure to submit them will lead to much more documents that you really do have to submit. And it takes a lot more time at this point. So now John and I decided to divide and conquer in this aspect. He handled 
Um, some portions of it, I handled all the reconciliations for the payroll since I have more background in payroll than John does. Um, I did all the reconciliations from the payroll um, side. The other thing I'm going to suggest to everybody is we found that we had errors in our payroll system with calculations by doing this process. So what I have, what we actually do now is we do a reconciliation of our payroll system from gross to net to make sure that those calculations are correct. Because that was part of an issue that we had here is that we had a calculation issue. So now we move to December of 2023 and we had a new IDR. This IDR now expanded again, based on what we provided on the July 23, we are now expanding the field again. Now they requested all of our union contracts for every union that we have and an explanation needed to be provided for these union contracts on certain areas um, like um, what is our policy in that union for accrued vacation leave, personal leave, military leave, sick leave and being paid to the employees. Then they wanted to us to give them an explanation to how we pay the uniform and boot allowances to these employees. Are they subject to employment tax? And if not, why? How is it substantiated? And we do have some unions that the boot allowances go are not through paid through payroll. They're on a reimbursable pay, basis through our accounts payable department. So that all had to be explained. Um, so now we move to March and April of 2024. We got a new IDR submitted and an audit uh, report received and the penalty amount was adjusted. They got so now they submitted a new um, IDR report giving us a deep, they wanted details of individuals who showed up on our 1099 report and on our employee um, file. Going through that, we've re we realized that some people were just classified incorrectly. So they were an employee in our system and they were classified incorrectly in our, our system for reimbursement purposes and their 1099 box was checked. So they got a 1099 and they also got a, um, a nine, uh, a W-2, so that triggered an issue. We then, then had some seasonal per diem employees who were seasonal per diem employees at one point during the year, they severed their employment and became consultants or vendors or whatever it meant bid at some other point of the year. So that caused them to get a W-2 and a 1099. Um, so it's important in this aspect to make sure that your vendor file is accurate. If your vendor file is not accurate, it is going to generate a, an extremely large amount of fines for you guys. So, um, and we learned that the hard way. So the revised audit report that we received with the adjusted penalty, we went from $55 million to $8 million. $8 million. Still, we were not happy with the $8 million report. We then again appealed the report. So $81,000 was differences in payroll. And these were the differences that we found that there was a calculation error in our payroll system. So at that point, there's nothing we could do about that. We can't fix that error then. So we're going to fix that error now. And then we received another seven, um, on our 1099, we had seven million nine hundred and seven point nine million million in fines for our 1099 W-9 issues in Form 4669. So that represents 24% of the amount we paid to those vendors at, at during the course of 2020. Um, so in June of 2024, which is the month that we're in right now, uh, they amended our penalty amount again after we went back and forth with them uh, regarding the 1099 file. And now we are at uh, $81,000 in fines for payroll differences and $124,000 in fines for one vendor that's outstanding that we do not work with any longer that is not in compliance that we are going to have to pay because they will not fill out the 4669 form for us, even though we're still trying. So what changes have we made here at the County of Bergen as a result of this IRS audit? Well, we have decided, well, I had decided and then John had decided with me that we were going to do an audit of our entire vendor file. Soup to nuts, 3,000 plus employees. Um, I sent out letters to every single one of them, making them update all their information. Well, when I tell you that I was public enemy number one to our vendors, I'm not kidding. Uh, these vendors were calling, cursing, yelling, screaming, carrying on because we told them if their forms are not in by 6.30 of 2024, we're deactivating their vendors until they 
they comply with us. We will no longer continue on with not having the proper documentation in our system and risk these fines in the future. Um, so we are starting to get a ton of those those forms back. So we'll see by the end of, by Monday how many people we have to deactivate until they comply. The other thing we did is we took this opportunity to also update all of our state and federal other forms that we require that are required of us to have as government agencies for our vendors. So the packet included our W-9 form, our business registration certificate update. If they were um, not, if they were um, exempt or they were a nonprofit, they had to provide us their determination letter from the IRS stating that they were a 501c3. Um, because there's a lot of people that mark off that exempt box on their 1090 on their W uh, 1099 form, and they're not um, they're not tax exempt. Just so you could be aware of that, and that causes an issue. Also, the Russian Belarus certificate and the Iran certificate, which is required by the state for us to pay our vendors. And everybody's probably sitting here saying, "Well, why did you do this?" Our best protection against the IRS is to use the documentation that the vendors supply us as our protection. So if the IRS tries to fine you, expect, even when you get the letters in um, at the end of every year that says, oh, your EINs don't match. If you supply the, the, the W-9 form that is filled out by the vendors to the IRS, that they provided us that information and that's why we paid them on that information, they do not find the entity regarding that because we're, we paid based on what was provided to us by that vendor. Um, so that's one good thing. And that's one thing that our IRS audit manager said to us is that make sure you have a W-9 on file for everybody. Because if you don't, it's an automatic penalty. So you are required to have a W-9 on file regardless for everybody. So even, and, and people, some of our municipalities are, are a little aggravated because we're asking them to fill out the W-9 forms. The IRS does not care if they're a government agency, non-government agency, nonprofit. They want a W-9 form on file for every vendor that you have in your system. So if that's one thing that I can stress, that is one thing I will stress is that make sure you have your W-9s on file. Um, Implementing other in things that we in implemented was, um, like I said, we do we're, we're doing a check now of our our payroll system to ensure that the the calculations are correct, so that we don't have the calculation issues with um, like we did. And those are kind of freak issues that happened. And that it all a lot of it stemmed from the elections, the increase in the elections that year, and people coming on and coming off and coming on and coming off. So that's what a lot of those um, stem from. Um, we are also implementing other measures when it comes to the, our 1099 filings. So we're using this audit and we're going in and we're making sure that people whose boxes should be checked for a 1099 are checked. And if they're not supposed to be checked, they're not checked so that people, we're just not sending 1099s all over the place and we're, we're directing them to the people that are supposed to be getting them based on what they are classifying themselves on their 1099. So that is another thing that we are doing here. So in all, the audit was was interesting. The audit, I don't think ever needed to be expanded to the point that we're at had our um, accountants filed what we asked them to file or what they needed to file in the very beginning. So your noncompliance is going to expand your their field of audit. And the more you expand your field of audit, the more they're going to look for and the more that they may find. Um, also, our first IDR, they gave us 30 days to reply. For every IDR after that, they only gave us two weeks. So not only do they expand your field, but they lessen your time to submit. So there were many of times that John and I were on the phone with the agent saying, can we have an extension? And it got to the point at one point that the, the IRS agent was not being very nice about it. And while I do understand his frustrations, our organization is not a small organization. So, um, but we got everything in and now we're just waiting for them to make a determination to whether or not the money that they're trying to find us is material enough for us to, to have to pay it. And then if it is, then we're just gonna have to 
pay the fine of the 124,000 81,000 and learn from our mistake and move on, which we're doing now to make sure that we have everything on file. So, is there any questions? Uh, there is a question okay. um, from uh, Susan. Uh, how do you treat LLCs for 1099 purposes based on what the vendor checks off on the form? Yeah, so we do it based on, so in our system, we use Municipal Software Inc. We don't have a classification for an LLC, although I'm trying to have our provide our software provider change that for us. So if it's an LLC um, corporation or S corp, we do not usually provide them a 1099. Um, but if it's a partnership, we do. But it all depends because sometimes they don't, they'll check off LLC and not give us a classification. So anybody that checks off that box and doesn't give us a classification, they get a 1099. Um, if we're not sure, we just send people 1099s. It doesn't harm us for sending the 1099s to individuals. Um, so if you're really not sure what to do, then just send out 1099s to that to those individuals. Uh, John and I also maybe, we talked about possibly sending out 1099s to every individual because we get 1099s all the time. As a, as a government agency, we don't have to do anything with them, but people send them to us because they, as the sender of the document, they'd rather be safe than sorry. So we are we are grappling with if we're going to at the end of this year send 1099s out to every single one of our vendors just to make sure we're covering all of our bases, except for our Medicare reimbursements individuals because they just a Medicare reimbursement of employees and our employees. But everybody else, we're thinking about sending them out to, just to cover our own bases, but the on the IRS side. Um. Stephanie asked the question, how frequently do you update the W-9s yearly or once when they start doing business with us? So when I came on board in 2018 here in, in the county, my rule was a new vendor is not set up unless we have a W-9 form. That was the rule that I put in when I got here because as I started to look through the file when I start, first started here, I realized that we didn't have that information for a lot of our vendors. So the problem that we were getting hit with was our past vendors, our people that were established prior to 2018 that were still vendors of ours. So a lot of those on that list were those individuals, not the newer individuals. So we right now had, like I said, we did the 3,000, we did the 3,000 mail out to all of our vendors this year. Um, my rule is going to be every two years, we're going to send out at least a W9 update. You don't need a BRC update every two years because the BRC basically stays unless the the um, business changes a, a, a name or something of that nature, their EIN number, anything of that. But we also implemented it. If, if somebody changes their address at any point, they have to provide us a new W-9 form. So we do not change addresses in our system without a new W-9 form being presented to us. And we do that because we want to make sure if there is tax documents that need to get to where they need to go, that we have the right address. And we do that by making them update their 1099 forms. So at least that usually we're gonna do them every two years now. That's gonna be our new policy every two years to send out a 1099 update request to our vendors just to make sure they're always on file. Although the IRS agent said to us that as long as we have one on file, it doesn't matter how old it is, that it's acceptable. I just don't agree with that because you can have an old one on file that has incorrect information on it that needs to be updated. So our rule of thumb is going to be every two years, get a new um, new form from them. There was also a, a comment uh, from someone. Uh, they said, if in doubt, send it out. Yep, I agree 100% with that. <laughs> I also wanna say that we use Scott for our arbitrage um, calculations also in Bergen County. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. <laughs> So we Melissa, did have. Oh, sorry, okay, ahead. Go ahead, Katie. You could, I was go ahead. just going to jump in with a poll. Yeah, before we um, change topics here, we have our second polling question on this topic. Um, what is the amount that the IRS expects you to withhold from a vendor if there is not a W nine on file? And I'll leave it open then share the results. So while we're waiting, uh, Melissa, my my firm does um, uh, deals with a number of IRS audits. Um, and also uh, penalty abatement. Um, you know, I agree with you. I mean, it's a tedious, time-consuming process, requires a lot of patience and, and diligence. 
to try and get through it. And, and it can take a, an extensive period of time. And as, as you mentioned also, just because you have a first refusal for an abatement doesn't mean you have to stop at that point. As long as you have uh, specific reasons or rationalizations, you can continue to try to get that penalty uh, abated or, or, or lessened. Um, probably one of the best um, other ways that we've had with getting um, a successful abatement of a penalty is with a client that doesn't have a lot of instances of noncompliance. <laughs> If you only have, you know, uh, a, the odd instance of noncompliance, the IRS is more willing to work with you. Correct. They are. They, and I mean, they get annoyed when it's when you keep on going back to them and say, can I have an extension? Can I have an extension? Or if you're telling them that you didn't know when you, you do know because it's on the IDR, that IDR is very, very detailed of what you need to send to them. So it's not like there is any guess of what they need. Um and or you just pick up the phone and you call your agent and say, can you, because I I did that a, quite a few times with him because we kept on going back and forth with the calculations because I said, I'm calculating it out. This is what it is. Like, and he's like, well, you got to do this. You got to go like, so they'll walk you through certain things, but at, a, at some point they just are going to stop being helpful if you stop being um, open with them to why things are not there. The other issue that you have to deal with if you do get abated a fine is where you're going to pay it from. People don't have a reserve to pay the IRS on their on their balance sheet because people don't typically think that they're going to pay the IRS anything. And when you come in with a, a price tag of $55 million, there is nowhere to pay that fine. So um, you got to be consistent and and keep on going back with back to the IRS because they'll keep they're going to take whatever you're going to give them right so if you're going to throw your hands up and say fine I'm going to pay you 55 million dollars I don't want to go through this process the IRS is going to say oh no they're not going to say no please don't pay me that 55 million dollars so <laughs> you have to keep going back and forth with them so we went from 55 million dollars to a little over 200 thousand dollars or so so I mean fighting back and and providing the information really does help you get your your abatement down. Twenty four percent is correct. You have to hold. They gonna make you uh, pay twenty four percent of what you've paid those vendors. Okay. I don't. We see did. It. Sorry, ahead, Katie. I was gonna say yeah. I don't see any questions either. We had a third poll. I'll just put up now. Um, in case anyone has any questions, as Bud said, put them in the Q and A or chat before we move on. And this last question, um, are local government entities required to file for a BRC? Thank you, give it another second. Make sure you get your responses in for credit. You should see the responses now. Hopefully it's a no. <laughs> yep, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Melissa. Appreciate it. I don't see any other questions or, or comments here. Um, why don't we take a five-minute break before we start with Sean and Frank? Uh, we'll be back in, in five minutes to uh, do our final presentation. Sounds good. We'll get started by 11.15, let's say. Okay. Thanks, Katie. Great. Sounds good. See you guys in five minutes.
You got out of the um, the appointment, huh, Frank? You're muted. You're you're muted. Yep. There you go. Uh, yeah. So I'm come. I've got it at four o'clock tonight. Oh, good to for you. To see you again, so. Hopefully I can get on a better schedule once I get in with him, but this is my first one, so he's very busy. That's good. Well, I guess it's good for him. Pays the bills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's bad for all the patients. Yeah, I just want to get this damn thing straightened out. God. Did you catch anything this morning? No, I didn't get a chance to go. I, I got I got oh, a little bit. I'm actually gonna go uh after this. I got a uh I got I got a Crab pot in the bay. I got to go get them, and then uh, I'll try to go throw a line in the water. Yeah, listen, and and with this, you know, to jump jump in. You yeah, know, you're, you're, just, you're, just so you know, we, we're the whole audience can see and hear us. Hear us too, Eddie. So. Oh, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll make crab cakes for everybody. There, okay. <laughs> So, Katie, we ready to restart? Yep, I think we're all set. I see most of our attendees back um, online, too. So I think we're good. Great. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm happy to have uh, Frank Bestone and, and Sean Canning here uh, for this uh, next session. Uh, Frank's career in municipal management in North Jersey spanned four decades, over 33 years in six diverse local jurisdictions. In 2013, he embarked on a second career in municipal consulting with the same drive and success. Uh, Frank is an innovative leader with vast management experience and a clear record of achievement in a complex, volatile, multitasking environment. In addition to excellence in general municipal management, Frank has developed specific expertise in areas of finance administration, contract negotiations, personnel organization, crisis control, environmental responsibility, and insurance loss management. In addition, Frank has been a consistent leader in municipal utility governance. He rounds out his public service by serving in various capacities, including long-term president on a number of private nonprofit boards. Frank uh, has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Fairleigh Dickinson University and a Master's in Public Administration from Penn State University. And I think Frank's uh, best nonprofit might be might be the Yarriton, uh, the Raritan uh, Yacht Club for the government. <laughs> That's one of them. Definitely based on your background uh, behind you there. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and it's Sean. Um, Sean, after having wasted the taxpayers' money for over a 31-year career, he moved into the private sector, forming the Shell Corporation with two partners of ill repute. He instructed purchasing as an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. After woefully preparing students for state exam, at least those who remained awake, he moved more full-time into a full-time uh, qualified purchasing agent role with uh, numerous towns and public organizations. Sean enjoys his downtime fishing, combing his hair, which I don't have any, uh, attending happy hours, and generally trying to become Jeffrey Lebowski. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you <laughs> so thanks but thanks for inviting us and uh, thank you for everybody out there i wish i could see you but uh, we can't um so we want to talk about um something that's really relevant and you may or may not know it's it's coming on monday so it's uh, certainly uh, 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 uh very timely and that is managing managing the uh the construction aspects of our daily um operations and the prevailing wage and frank's going to start out in a second uh, i just want to give you an overview prevailing wage is going up department of labor has some changes uh, that are certainly coming, and, and we know they can be very aggressive. And uh, usually, in your roles, we get what do we get? You know, we get the um, the 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 one quote from your police or public works, or you know, those are usually the two two uh, main culprits. But from any part of your organization, and we're going to deal with the prevailing wage and all the myriad of things that they keep throwing at us, uh, especially since 2019, and just trying to manage that and our 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 responsibilities, the state's expectations. And still trying to get our tasks done. So, well, we're going to delve into it. Uh, Frank, I guess I'll share the screen, and then you tell me when you want me to advance. Great, thank you. Okay, excellent. Sure. Okay. Share screen. And 
we go. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is talk about um, what is considered public work. Um, and, and and listen, we, in our careers, we've all encountered, uh, I know I have in, encountered, you know, unique circumstances with these kind of things. Um, probably the most unique, one of the most unique ones uh, was when uh, our Little League wanted to uh, uh, partner with the town to build uh, uh, a facility at the Little League uh, field. And it all of these kind of things became a problem because they felt since they, when they were spending their money building on public property, they didn't feel that they needed to comply with anything. And it was, you know, it was interesting. Uh, but we all probably encounter those ki kinds of things somewhere along in our, our career. So public work basically is all encompassing construction, reconstruction, demolition, alteration, custom fabrication, or repair work, maintenance work, you know, that is paid in whole or in part out of the funds of the public body, except for work performed under a rehab program. Um, and that 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 matches perfectly with my example of the, the, the Little League. Um, public work also means construction, reconstruction, demolition, alteration, custom fabrication, etc., done on any property or premises, whether or not the work is paid for by public funds, if at the time of entering into the contract, the property or premises is owned by the public body or not less than 55% of the property or premises is leased by the public body or is subject to an agreement to be subsequently leased by the public body, B, the portion of the property or premises that is leased or subject to an agreement to be subsequently leased by the public body measures more than 20,000 square feet. So. Basically, if you're spending public money, um, it, that's considered public work. Or if you're doing work, if work is being done on public property, um, even with you know some private funding, that is considered public work. You know, Frank, if I could chime in real quick, one of the things we're going to run into often, and and it's you know don't, don't get lost in the weeds of the uh, the public definitions, but uh, you'll get. Um, you know, uh, police want to do a new uh, a, a video camera system in your municipal building. And, and it's, you know, we got a couple of quotes, um, but part of it is they're running wires. You know, if they're running wires, Department of Labor is going to consider that um, an alteration. So anything that alters walls, moves anything, they're very strict about that. Um, do you want me to move on, Frank, or no? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So, um, so just some examples. I, I, I gave you one that was interesting in my career. So yeah, a private fire department. Um, but if the township is paying for the project, um, that that is considered uh, public work. Um, it means a digital sign customization in excess of thirty thousand dollars total project costs, and we'll talk about aggregation later. Um, but that that that's important. And 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 as Sean said, you know, the the the, the, the definition of public work is pretty much all encompassing. So. If you're running the wire, you're doing that kind of work, it's public work. Um, and then it's any alteration, construction, or demolition in excess of the prevailing wage threshold and meeting the locations that we just talked about in the previous slide. You know, ju just be aware on, on, on the, the reason I mentioned digital signs, I just ran into this uh, for the first time um, about uh, three, four months ago. Um, back in 2021, there was a, uh, a local finance notice which had come out and they, they expanded uh, prevailing wage uh, to include, um, um, you know, custom fabrication. And one of those custom fabrications was your digital signs. And a lot of those digital sign companies out there don't have public works contractor reg. So be aware of it. And it's total project cost, too. So it's not just a sign. You know, if we're hiring masons, we're hiring electricians uh, and whatnot, you know, we have to run conduit, that sort of thing. So those total project costs go towards that custom fabrication. So it's a, it's a fairly new thing, which you may or may not be aware of, uh, but just be aware that it's it's out there now. And here we go. Sure. Um, so talk, just to follow up on that, we're talking about total project costs. So um, as, as Sean said, you know, the electrical work, the excavation, custom fabrication, supplies and materials, these things are bought separately. And, 
I've encountered this in my uh, career many times where, you know, you, you have uh, um, people try to be creative and split things out to to get around the rules. That doesn't work. I mean, you, you and, and I've, I've gotten into some, you know, pretty heavy duty disagreements with people because they're trying to be very creative and circumventing the purpose and intent of the law. Um, and that just that just gets you into trouble. So if any of the above and preceding slides are true, that equals prevailing wage and all that accompanies with it that we're going to talk about. So all of the things we just talked about on these slides um, are, are going to factor into having to comply with the prevailing wage issues. So like, what is happening? Um, as of Monday, um, the prevailing wage uh, thresholds increasing from $16,263 to $19,375 for municipalities. Interesting to note that all others are still at $2,000. And that's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, public utilities, those kind of things. Um, Schools, counties. Yeah. So, yeah. So all, all other public entities are still at two thousand dollars. This is unique to municipalities, um, and you know, as as Sean said, this this really hasn't been publicized. I, you know, as a retired uh, administrator, I'm still I'm a retired member of the New Jersey Municipal Management Association, and multiple notices come out from the NJMMA. Um, there's there's always discussions about different topics. Um, that that all the administrators exchanged emails. I must have gotten 30 emails yesterday with them NJMMA topics uh, on a variety of, of questions that are raised and, and answers. I haven't seen anything on this, um, which I find interesting because all of a sudden here we come July 1st and, and, and really... Um, I know with administrators, this hasn't been publicized. I, I don't know if that's true with uh, CMFOs also. But, um, yeah, it, starting Monday, this is happening. And, I, and I, I I wasn't aware of it until I talked to Sean about it. Now, again, I'm not an active administrator, but didn't see anything. Uh, yeah, so, interesting poll question. How many people are prepared on uh, Monday? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so what is what is required when we have a prevailing wage job? Okay, so get, get into the the nitty gritty here. Um, this and again, this is two two thousand and twenty one. Um, time flies. Um, contract language to be in contracts. Um, there's a citation required contractual provisions liability of contract or insurity for excess costs. Um, every contract, public contract uh, that requires this shall contain a prevailing wage, a provision stating the prevailing wage rate, which can be paid to the workers, employees in performance of the contract. And the contract shall contain a stipulation that such workers shall be paid not less than such prevailing wage rate. So there's the requirement that the vendor pay the prevailing wage rate. Such contracts shall also contain a provision that in the event that it is found that any worker employed by the contractor or any subcontractor covered by said contract has been paid a rate of wages less than the prevailing wage required to be paid by the contract, the public body may terminate the contractor or subcontractor's right to proceed with the work or such part of the work in which there has been a failure to pay the required wages and to prosecute the work to be to be completion uh, or otherwise. Um, so the contractors and his and their surety shall be liable for any excess costs occasioned by the public body. So there's a, there's a lot of um, requirements. Um, once 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 it's in the contract, if the contractor has a contract that provides for this provision. Um, if they're not in compliance, um, they're accountable for that. Frank, Frank, if I could chime in on this. So this has been around since 21. All, all my contracts and all my clients have had this, uh, you know, if, in, in our uh, bid specifications and also our uh, construction contracts. Uh, your QPAs really should be up on this. If they're not, it's, it's something you really should take back 
and just make sure that even your routine contracts for construction, a lot of times we don't have the big, big packages. You know, we have a, you know, $25,000 landscape wall or something like that. Um, but just that, that, that contract that gets slapped on uh, with the resolution, you know, make sure that part of the language that they have this in with the, um, uh, the prevailing wage or the public works contract or reg portion of your contract. So it's, it's a fairly new law accompanying this as well. And we're not going to touch upon it in this slide is a, uh, it's an, it's actually an automatic uh, rejection of bids and not too many contractors know about it and haven't uh, enacted on it. But part of this 2021 law was a, a requirement and it's a separate form. Any bidder on a construction contract that is 10% or more lower than the next, um, uh, next bidder has to sign this this form. I have it if anybody needs to, to email it down the road that they are going to pay prevailing wage. Fail, and, and it's not at time of bid, so it's not like a fatal um, fatal flaw. So between bid and uh, resolution uh, award, they can submit this form. So if you know you have a, a low bidder that's ten percent or more low, uh, make sure this form gets to them and they sign it because it's that real common knowledge out there. I've I've seen it. I found only one vendor that was aware of it, um, but they actually in the law it says they can actually be. Uh, knocked out of that first position uh, in the bid as a rejection and then have to move to second. So this 2021 law has some teeth into it. It's not really well known and not circulated, but it's it's there. So just be aware of it. Okay, next slide. Yep. Okay. Hey, okay, guys, so that uh, there was one question posed just uh, asking if they could get a copy of your slide presentation after. Uh, Absolutely. And be happy. Okay. Be happy to. Great. Thank you. Okay, so the responsibility of the CMFO, okay, same law, same citation, failure to pay prevailing wages, notice to commissioner, and protest by workers. So, first, the fiscal or financial officer of any public body having public work performed under which any worker shall have been paid less than the prevailing wage shall forthwith notify the commissioner in writing of the name of the person or firm failing to pay the prevailing wages. So this is going to the Department of Labor. So the the finance officer has a, a requirement, should they learn of uh, a violation, they have to notify in writing um, and write to the Department of Labor notifying the commissioner of the violation. So if we find out the contract is not paying prevailing wage, the CFO has to report it to the Department of Labor. Um, one interesting fact here is you do not have a responsibility, have, you do not have an obligation to check every certified payroll that comes in, but if you're made aware, um, this is the responsibility. So um, you don't have to pretty much audit the certified payroll that comes in, um, but if you're made aware of a violation, it's your responsibility to um uh, notified Department of Labor. I find this interesting because I remember um, one, one of my first jobs in the beginning of my career, I worked for Morris County Community Development administering uh, federal uh, grants to municipalities. And one of my jobs was to actually go out on the federal jobs. One of my jobs was actually to go out and interview um, em employees, uh, do a spot check on a job and interview employees to ensure that they were be pay, being paid a uh, prevailing wage. Frank, are there pe uh, specific penalties associated with non-compliance? Um, I, I could jump in. Okay. Yeah, you know, the Department of Labor is uh, on, on this and also if they uh, don't have a public works contractor, but I, I think they can levy up to $2,500 a day uh, to the vendor. They, they won't find towns. It's more embarrassing for the towns, but the, the administrative... Um, Fine. From what I've seen in researching their uh, FAQs on their website, it's upwards of twenty five hundred per day uh, for violations. So you know, it's a it's a great question, bud. Because what do we get with a lot of towns? You know, it's like, oh, we're going to use Frank and Sean because they've been here forever. They're good people. You know, I know them, so they just do the work. Well, you know, I, I got to tell you, I don't, I don't know if I want a friend of mine <laughs> sticking it to me with twenty five hundred dollars a day. Uh, so that's 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 one of the pitfalls of of those. You know, we all like our local vendors, but they got to comply. So it's it's a serious fine. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and and, it, and in addition to the fine, uh, all, all of the um, uh, caveats in the previous slides of of, uh, of 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 you know losing the contract or uh, and or and the, and their, and your surety having to make up uh, any cost to the municipality, it's it, there. There's a lot of teeth to this. 
Okay, responsibility of the QPA. Um, again, same uh, statute, uh, pro prohibition against award of contract for non-compliant contractors and definition of interest presumption. The public body awarding any contract for public work shall first ascertain from the commissioner the list of names of contractors or subcontractors who have failed to pay prevailing wage as determined in section 13 of the act and no contract shall be awarded to such contractor or subcontractor or any firm, corporation, or partnership in which such contractor or subcontractor has an interest until three years have elapsed from the date of listing as determined in Section 13 of the Act. So um, basically, um, again, another penalty um, is that you, you, are, you are disbarred. Um, you can be disbarred for uh, violating... As the, the, the contractor can be disbarred for violating the provision of the prevailing wage. And there is a there is a list and you can see the tabs here um, of D, you, they, they provide a list of deboard contractors and authorized contractors. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to jump on this, uh, Frank. So so after every bid I do, uh, if it's construction, you know what? You, you got to run the company and you got to run the principal, the name. So those ownership documents become very important. I'll, I'll give you a uh, this should take us right to it. And there it is. Um, this is the debarment list. So that link, like I said, your QPA should be doing this after your construction contracts. You know, uh, when I work with the engineers, when they want to do the bids, that's fine. I just ask for the um, uh, the low three bids and then just get all their ownerships, get their names. And again, this is the debarred list. And, you know, all these people that are on here, they are debarred. Uh, so if they pop up on here, you know, they can't get the job. They are uh, they're, they're forbidden on that one. Um, and the other link is... You know, this is actually I find as useful as the debarred one, and this is the authorized contractors. So uh, this is actually pretty good. Where we'll get a uh, declared sub subcontractor, they have to have the public works contractor, especially if it's if it's one of the prime uh, the subs, whether it's electrical, heating, steel work, you know, plumbing, whatever. Um, so they'll they'll give the name, and it's quick and easy to run and make sure. Okay, this is the the ones they are indeed registered. So uh, that's good. You know, th this goes back to where mainly I'll use this when I'm getting quotes. You know, uh, we want, um, you know, wires run, you know, some sort of uh, construction. I'm getting quotes from Public Works. One of the first places I go to is I go right here. If they're not on there. We can't use them. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll delve into that. Um, well, we got a question, I think. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to give this to you in the, uh, in the in the PDF printout. But let's go back here real quick. If you go to, uh, I think it's a quick search. So we do uh, New Jersey Department of Labor um, Prevailing Wage. They're not going to show it to me, I bet. Uh, if not, if you email me, I will. Uh, here we go. Department, Department of Labor Workforce Development. They'll have debarment list, uh, list of registered contractors. Um, let me see if I can get that link. I'll put it up on chat for everybody. That that should, if you copy that link, that should help you out. Oops. Okay. Um, Frank, am I jumping in here? Yeah, yeah. I just, I just had a question. How how big a deal is it for a, a contractor to get on the authorized list? You know, it's kind of it's, it's a little bit of a pain. Okay, so a little bit of a background, and and since it's New Jersey, it's it's politically intertwined. Imagine that. Um, so we've had this. <laughs> We've had this this law, I think it's been since 1991 or 99, forgive me for the uh, not knowing the years. And one of the vendors had said they were not aware of the new laws. And I, like, it's better. I, I know it's, it's the 90s, but uh, it was one of those two years. So there was some teeth put into it by Governor Murphy going back in 2019, I believe. Um, and what happened was, so you got to get the public works contract. It's really not that big a deal. They got to pay the money. Uh, they have to send in paperwork to Department of Labor. And for the most part, it's there. it takes a couple of weeks and they're able to get it. The teeth of the matter, and this has really gone to the detriment of public work in the state of New Jersey, is there is a requirement to have an apprenticeship program. So that apprenticeship program, if you are a small firm, it leans it towards the big firms. Why did this come into effect? It was kind of a payback to the unions for the support in the election. That was the story back then. So um, if you don't have an apprenticeship program, I believe the last number I had heard bantied about was $10,000 you have to pay for uh, basically towards an apprenticeship program that goes to wherever it goes to at the Department of Labor. So that is one of the sticking points about uh, small vendors. 
getting public works contractor registration because it just it's so costly. And if they're not getting public work, you know, why spend that money? You know, it's already tight with them. So it's really become a problem. And I kind of predicted back in 19 when this came out that we were going to really wash out a lot of the small uh, vendors in the market. And you can see increases in uh, prices. And that was before inflation. And uh, yeah, you know, and that's that's exactly what's happened. A lot of the small um, uh, small folks have really been kind of washed out. I'll give you an example. Up in one of my clients up in Sussex County, we're, we're trying to get a roof, you know, public works roof put on. And it's really, really tough to find roofers with the public works contractor reg. So we're really trying to pull down to Little Falls in Bergen County and, and get contractors up there. So uh, it's an issue. Okay. Um, so I'll jump in here a little bit. Frank, just give me a flag when we get back to you. I think it's uh, slide 18, please. Yep. Um, so, so more responsibilities of your QPA. Again, a lot of you may be QPAs in here and, you know, I'm preaching to the choir. For those that aren't, and maybe it's your administrator, maybe it's somebody else who, who doubles up their duties. But again, in addition to running the principles of companies through um, construction, you know, we have to go through agency department disqualification, okay, pursuant to uh, executive orders. And that looks like this. This is a treasury debar. All right, so this is the treasury debarment uh, search page, and uh, they have debarment for construction, medical, professional, and vendors. So we got this is Department of the um, of the Treasury, okay, which is different than Department of Labor. Okay, so it's just so they, they are they are debarred for you know whatever other reasons that they have uh, over there. But this is an old law. This is a 1988 law. So we're supposed to be running uh, not just construction, all your all your bids, and and if you have time, either, even your quotes and some of your other vendors. And uh, again, I'm I'm on the site quite a bit run the name of the company and you run the vendors. That's why we want the ownership um, from uh, from these folks. Um, okay, here's another one. Sam's Federal Debarment. This was a um, 2000 and I believe 17 or 2019 law. It was a local finance notice and it basically was a reciprocity. So what New Jersey said was that if you're barred at the federal level, so we would do a search at sam.gov, you know, and for, you know, whatever, uh, um, uh, the, the owner's name, you know, you run the owner's names, the principals, you run the vendor's names. Uh, if they're debarred at the federal level, they are debarred in New Jersey. So it's a reciprocity thing. So that's there. Be aware. I do this all the time. I've never once run into somebody debarred at the federal level, but I'm, I'm sure it will at some point. Um, Treasury also sent this thing out called the wall, uh, kind of this, this shaming thing. <laughs> so so uh, it's uh, Office of Strategic Enforcement and Compliance. It's also Department of Labor. We're supposed to be running them through the wall. So you got a question. Yeah, there's a chat item. Uh, I'm in Stillwater Township and we had a roof replaced uh, last year. Uh, Sean can contact me for vendor info if interested. CFO at stillwatertwp.com. Thank you. I love you. <laughs> You're helping me out a lot. <laughs> I will be in touch. <laughs> um, so the the wall uh, has it in both uh, PDF and Excel. Uh, so make sure make sure your uh, your folks are jumping in that. And the very last one is Iran and uh, Russia Belarus sanctions list. So this has been bantied about as well several times. Last um, August, there was a couple of local finance notices that kind of you know uh, kind of firmed things up, and then took it away because it was a Treasury notice uh, uh, in August saying we can't do it because of an appellate division lawsuit at federal. Um, so this past March, there was a brand new elephant that came out, and they they, they somehow were able to, to to put a camel through a needle or whatever. Um, so the uh, um, the, the, the way it stands now is on all of our goods and services, they have to do a separate Iran um, uh, form, and then they have to do the Belarus-Russia form. So that's in goods and services. When it comes to construction, uh, it's just Iran. So the, from this local finance notice, it's saying that the, that the uh, Russia-Belarus that Department of Labor is going to capture that when they do the uh, public works contractor uh, recertification. So they, it says they're going to capture that. So there's nothing wrong with you know putting it in there with the extra form, but... Uh, uh, all that's really required is just that Iran form. Once we get it, we're supposed to get their certification. And then there's this uh, Office of Foreign Assets Control. This link is right in the local finance notice. It's also in the um, uh, in the PowerPoint that I'll, uh, that I'll send to all of you if, if you want. Uh, but there's the sanctions list. And again, you'll put whatever name in there and it'll tell you whatever they're, uh, whatever they're in violation of. Again, it's I haven't run into anybody from you know in any one of our counties that has been contributing to the mullahs or to uh, Putin, uh, but it's there. Uh, all right, so we're going to get into so this 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 new prevailing wage managing this it, it kind of gives us a new window. So we used to have the the window between sixteen two six three and then pay to play. Uh, so you could conceivably have a public work uh, and all the things that are associated with that, but we don't have to do the pay to play resolution. So now we've kind of created a different um, a window gap here. So we we have the the uh, the pay to play window 
from $17,500.01, okay, remember, pay to play is over $17,500, uh, to $19,99. So the way they're written a little bit is once you hit uh, $19,375, prevailing wage kicks in. Uh, in pay to play, $17,500 even does not kick in. It's in excess of the pay to play threshold. So um, if you have this window between $17,501 to $19,374.99, no prevailing wage, no public works contractor, but we now have pay to play. So pay to play is a whole nother level, which which I'm sure uh, we're familiar with, but it's, not, it's nice to go over because there's still a lot of confusion out there uh, on the pay to place. So unless it's a bid or a cooperative, uh, non-national co-op, I'm going to touch upon that later too. It's another area that really gets abused. So what do we have to have? Well, we have to have multiple quotes, two, three, you know, depending on who you talk to, your policy. The statute at uh, 4011-6.1 uh, says multiple quotes. Okay, so multiple me, to me means, you know, two or anybody. Um we have to get the federal debarment form. Okay, here's another another item. Uh, you may or may not be aware, of particular who's dealing with construction, whether it's your, uh, usually it's going to be public works. I'm not picking on them. It's just, that's what they usually deal with. Uh, your federal debarment form is required for anything over $2,000. So make sure you're capturing it. All right, anything over $2,000, that's that federal SAM.gov, the federal form on that. Any construction over 2000 we need that form. Uh, the Iran form, okay, we need that. Uh, again, no Russia, we already uh, touched upon that. Business Reg, the BRC, uh, affirmative action. Again, I, uh, I, I guess another polling question for everybody. You know, do you know who your your PACO is or PACO? It's the Public Agency Compliance Officer. Now we're dealing with affirmative action, uh, and every uh, organization by resolution at the beginning of the year, at reorg or shortly thereafter, has to have the Public Agency Compliance Officer. I've been through four of those audits uh, in my career. One I didn't do very well. The other three I learned very quickly from, and they were easy peasy. Uh, so you have to make sure that you're getting the affirmative action certificate from uh, your folks. And that's either a SEER, that's that gold certificate, certificate of uh, employment information report, or an AA302, which is a placeholder. AA302 is a uh, basically an application to get your SEER. They give it to you. We say, yay, thank you. Very nice. Now mail it to uh, Treasury with a $150 check. Everything has a, a dollar sign attached to it. And they will send that back in six weeks and give them that gold certificate. Treasury, when they do their audit on you, they will be looking for... If you have two years of AA302s uh, in a row, they're telling you you're not supposed to hire that vendor and they should be um, uh, kicked off that job or not awarded that job because they're gaming the system. The AA302 is a one bite at the apple uh, thing and they're supposed to give send that and the money uh, down to Treasury and get the SEER. Um, if we're doing pay to play and it's not fair enough, oh, we got a question here. Yes, uh, is Even there a threshold to acquire a CEIR? You know, that's a, that is a great question. Um, and, and I asked that and they've never really answered it. They, they, they kind of want you to get it with every um, procurement. I know when when I send something in from the canning group, everybody gets my SEER. doesn't matter you know how little or how much uh, the contract is. They get the SEER. Uh, I usually ask for it if, if, if anybody in here is uh, uh, my clients. Uh, everybody has a vendor manual. So they'll have a vendor manual. And one of those required documents is a SEER. I like to just capture anyhow to make sure that if Treasury does come on an audit, we kind of have the record packed. Um, but uh, I would make it as part of your uh, routine course of business. Are you going to break somebody's chops over a three thousand dollar, you know, one time thing over not having it? You know, probably not. Um, but uh, definitely over seventeen five. I, I think over seventeen five is a, is is a definite. I try to capture it below that as well. Um, all right. So if we're not doing fair and open, so we have the pay to play. So if we're doing a non fair and open, we need the Bed C business entity contribution disclosure form. Uh, that's the chapter nineteen. We call it Bed C. And then the PCD, the political contribution form, that's the chapter 271. And again, these are for non-fair and open. So if we're doing a, uh, I'll get into what fair and open is in a second. Hey, Sean, I was yeah. just going to chime in and launch um, one of your polling questions. I did hear you say a couple of those along that would be good to ask. I just wanted, you said, um, how many people know who there, was it PACO is? Is that P-A-C-O? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just making sure I spelled that right. So I'll, I can launch that one first if... Um, okay. We want to ask the audience, hopefully that's right. So do you know who your PACO is? Yeah, I was just hoping I spelled that right. I'll leave it open and then share with you guys in about 30 seconds. And I okay. got that other question too added in um, about who's prepared for the new um, rates on Monday. So we can launch that one um, after this if we want to gauge that too. Yeah, yeah, I'd be interested in that. That's that's, that's a good, uh, a good, good question. question. Thank you. Sure. All right, I'll leave it open for another second. Make sure you get your responses in. Okay. And it looks like we are pretty 
split here. You guys should see the results now. Oh. Interesting. And let me launch that other question um, before we move on. Um, so this second question is, are you prepared for the new prevailing wage rate taking effect on Monday? Hopefully that's worded all right. Then you have a couple options there. I figured some of you may be hearing of it for the first time because I know, Frank, you said you were uh, surprised too, so. All right, I'll give it another second and then share. Okay, another bit of a divide. You guys should see the responses now. There you go. Interesting. Thank you, guys. Oh, no, thank you. That's, I'm, I'm glad you, you captured them. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, do I get into this? I hope so. I just want to touch upon fair and open real quick. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I belabored the point enough. <laughs> um, so... What's fair and open? Uh, you know, fair and open is anything that think advertisement, cooperative satisfy this, bid satisfy this, competitive contract satisfy this. If we're doing quotes though, you know, what's a fair and open? Well, you know, we pulled three people. That's that's not fair and open. So fair and open is anything uh, up on your website for a minimum of ten days uh, on um, uh, on the um, uh, in the newspaper for ten days. We do an advertisement ten days minimum. That's fair and open. Non fair and open, or the, 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 if you look in the law, there really is no term called non fair and open. Uh, uh, Mark Pfeiffer says they invented it back uh, uh, it, back in the day to try to discourage towns from doing it. It's actually required disclosure is the term that's in the law. So uh, required disclosure or non fair and open is we're calling you know two people, three people, multiples. Uh, in the case of uh, professionals, we don't have to call multiples because they're exempt from the local public contract law. So if we're calling an attorney, auditor, uh, you know what have you. Engineers, you know, we can just get a, a, a non-fair and open quote from, you know, whoever. So that's that's the differentiation between that when it comes to pay to play. Um, last year's 2023-14 uh, local finance notice, another one that, that, that kind of changed things uh, significantly for the pay to play uh, in the state of New Jersey. So, um, you know, there was two real big things that, that I took out of it from our purchasing standpoint. One was it lowered the contribution level from $300 to $200. Uh, but it also uh, gave the, gave a lot more power to your QPA. So it specifically authorizes that your QPA, uh, they have the authorization to approve window contracts. So what's a window contract? Windows from 17.5 to your bid threshold. So currently the bid threshold, the, the upper limit is $44,000. That'll be going up again next June, just an FYI. Uh, they, they change it every five years next year. Next June, it, it, I would expect it to be uh, coming back out. So... The, the new LFN uh, allows the QPA, as long as we follow the law on this, so either we do a fair and open 10 days or we do a non-fair and open, we get the um, the bed C and the PCD back, uh, uh, then the, the the QPA can approve the requisition. I, I wrote right then and there, that's not entirely true. Uh, if not, it's 10 days after re receiving the disclosures, um, uh, then we, we can approve the re the, uh, the requisition. Out of all my clients, there's only one that's, that's kind of uh, uh, really wanted me to do that. A lot of the others, I, I'm kind of a believer in this. The, the governing body likes to know what's going on. So it's really not a big deal to do the uh, the resolutions through their fair and open or a, a non-fair and open. So that's kind of still the normal course of business. But just be aware that if the governing body doesn't want to uh, have control of it, very few do not, uh, the QPA can uh, approve those through requisitions. So if the agency conducted a fair and open procurement, yada, 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 then no disclosures. Uh, if the QPR, QPA has authority to approve, then we just do a rec. All right. Uh, okay, pay to play window plus prevailing wage up to $44,000. So all of the proceeding. So I guess we have that new gap now between $17,500 and one cent to $19,374.99. That's just a pay to play gap. No prevailing wage, no public works contract or none of that stuff. We get now from $19,375 up to $44,000. All of the proceeding. So your public works contract or registration, they must have. And, and I do seminars all the time for, for uh, the clients that I uh, that I serve. Uh, and even those that, that I don't serve, um, I tell them first and foremost, do yourself a favor and do me a favor, please. Um, when, when they're going to get quotes, the very first question they should be asking any of the local contractors is, do you have the PWCRA, the Public Works Contractor Registration uh, Certificate Act? Uh, and if the answer is no, move on, because you're just wasting their time. You're wasting my time. And, and I, I, you know, you probably get the sob stories just like I do. Well, you know, Frank's a great guy. He's been doing work. 
Yes, I love them too. However, we can't give you the job. Um, so they have to have the departments. Tell the departments, stop getting quotes from people they know but do not have the certificate. We can't use them. And I can't tell you how many times I, I, get, I deal with this in the course of a month, probably five times every month. It does. It's, it's, it never ends. Um, they're supposed to send in certified payrolls within 10 days of their own payroll. All right. And again, it's not to, we're not obligated to check that. Uh, you know, Frank gave a, some of his stories when he was administrator. And, and one of that came to mind with me, one of the towns I was admitting, um, we were doing a, a public play, playground and we had hired uh, union carpenters. It was it was a build your own. We had the material. We did bids the whole bit. So we had union carpenters, six of them on the job. We had gone to the union shop and they, they were there helping our, our public works personnel uh, assemble this. And uh, somebody must have drove by and, and had to be, a, I guess, a union person because they called down to Department of Labor. And let me tell you, Department of Labor, um, two things at Department of Labor. One, they are really quick <laughs> because within hours, there was an inspector in my office wanted to see the certified payrolls and they were completely in order, pulled out the files, said, here you go. And I uh, told them it was union carpenters and they were there less than five minutes, said thank you and walked out. Um, so, and if not, there would have been all the sanctions. The second is, I got to tell you, out of all the departments in Trenton, and, and I, I've had to call all of them for one reason or another, they pick up the phone and they're actually pretty darn helpful, uh, and including like one of their big inspectors. He will, uh, he's, he's emailed me before and stuff, usually within a day. Uh, so they're a pretty responsive department. I, I don't find that with uh, uh, some of the other departments, but DOL really is. Um, so just so you know. Um, Back to the affirmative action. If it's construction, we need an AA two hundred one. All right, and that's that's not so much net for construction. We need the um, initial workforce report. Okay, and that goes back to your PACO laws. Um, so the, the the forms are uh, they have a manual they put out uh, admin, administering public contracts. I don't have it in this uh, uh, in this in this uh, presentation, but if, if again, if you email me, I can get it over to you. And Treasury updates that every couple of years. So there's an AA two hundred one form. That's your initial workforce report report. And then AA202, that comes in with your certified payrolls. Most vendors, Earl Asphalt, uh, I deal with them a lot. Uh, some of the other ones, they're really good about this stuff because they, they they know what's required. Uh, AA202 is your monthly workforce compliance report. That comes in and uh, make sure you capture it because it has to be on file. Again, Treasury is going to look at it. Why? Well, whatever your initial workforce was and you only have three people, you got awarded a, a large contract. They want to make sure that when you're hiring people that it's an actually equal opportunity. We're not just going to call my friends a happy hour and say, hey, come on, I, I hired you. So, um, you know, that's 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 what they're looking for. So make sure they file that. All right. Frank, is this you? Um, no, no. Okay. We, I, we, this is uh, this is slide 14. I pick up. Eight. Okay. Um, so emergencies, we touch upon emergencies and, and, and mainly as they deal with construction. So what's an emergency? What's not? Well, an emergency is a hurricane, a flood, you know, Hurricane Sandy, sewer main break, water pump station failure, anything that you can hang your hat on that affects the public safety, health uh, and welfare. Uh, of the your your populace. What's not an emergency? The department forgot to put in a requisition in the encumbrance system. You know, proper prior planning. Sorry. Uh, poor inventory practices, depending on the circumstances. I've had this, and I'm sure you all have. <laughs> Elected officials come into your office and they want to play ground Monday. They don't care. Just they're, they're ordering you to do it. Well, not an emergency. Sorry, there, uh, Mayor, but not going to happen. Um, and failure to plan on your part. That's you know, it's a the old proper prior planning uh, acronym. All right. So emergencies and prevailing wage. All right. No matter how much the emergency is, okay, so we're going to do, this is going to be a cover all here. Uh, if it is above prevailing wage, all of the preceding documents required, except for, so all those documents we gave you a couple slides back, all of them are required except for pay to play. Pay to play is exempt from, now the pay to play laws, they call it exigencies. They don't call it emergency. The term that they use is exigency. Same thing. So in the pay to play laws, exigencies, uh, they are exempt. From, so so we got to get all those um uh, all the documents we said before, no pay to play. So don't waste our time or your time. We're not going to need it. But Sean, I think you should mention, you know, and, and that most people probably know this, but it, it goes, it bears mentioning that yeah, you, you have this exception for emergencies. However, uh, when you talk about emergencies, there are all, all a, a, a slew of requirements to do an emergency properly. And I've seen uh, municipalities screw up on that. I mean, you, 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 there's, there's a bunch of, uh, documentation and resolutions that need to be uh, executed in order to have a, a proper emergency. You're right. That's a good point. You, you know, in the administrative code, I think it's uh, 534, 4-6, I think, or 6, chapter 6, whatever it is. Um, they, they actually tell you how to do it, Frank. So if, if anybody needs it, it's in the administrative code. And one of them, said, or two of them uh, on there says you have to have a policy. So you should have a purchasing policy uh, to your organization. And uh, the, the one who's authorized 
to authorize the emergency is the CEO, which is generally your mayor or your executive director, you know, what have you, or their designee. So that could be your BA, your CFO, you know, whoever. Uh, so that's a good point. Thank you, Frank. Um, okay, quotes. So let's talk, touch upon quotes and as they deal with uh, construction and, and pretty much everything. So not all quotes are created equal. Remember, a non-quote is a legal quote. You'll hear myself and Reinhardt sometimes joke around saying Paul McDonald's, uh, you know, for the non-quote, that sort of thing. You know, please don't. We like to joke around. But, uh, you know, if, if, if uh, somebody does not quote, you know, if we're looking for a recreation uniform supply and we email for a supply of 100 uniform shirts and they don't respond, document it. It's a non-quote. That is a legal quote under the law. Um, satisfies one of the two or three multiples of statute or mandatory quotes if we're above the quote threshold. What is your quote threshold? Twenty uh, is fifteen percent of your bid threshold. So currently, if you have a QPA, it's sixty six hundred. I think it's twenty six twenty five if you don't, because that would be fifteen percent of your um, seventeen thousand five hundred. Uh, incomparable multiple quotes. This is another kind of mis misnomer. So make sure you, you talk to your folks at your next staff meeting um, that in multiple quotes you can go with a higher quote. You can um, because it's not lowest responsible quote or the standard is bidder lowest responsible bidder. But when it comes to quotes. The statute at 6.1 says the award shall be made to a vendor whose response is the most advantageous price and other factors considered. Uh, and you'll see that same language in the uh, competitive contract statutes. That's how we award a comp contract that's under 4.1, um, 11-4.1 in the, uh, that chapter. Um, so what are price and other factors? Well, managerial ability, again, you know, how long have they been in business? And, and you know, they've been here 30, that, you know, 33 years, you know, that the, they have the, uh, the, the their, their systems internally are just you know, wonderful. Um, technical ability, you know what, they're, they're technicians for, you know, a pump, pump repair, you know, they're, they're all certified through whatever national organization uh, certifies uh, the top mechanics and pump mechanics. So their technical ability is, you know, so, so superior to, you know, Frank and I who just started up and, you know, bought a set of wrenches. Uh, you can go with the higher quote uh, based on that. And uh, cost factors, you know, your cost factors, what's the price? So if we get a quote for electrical work at the water utility, the amount usually does not require a bid. We get quotes. Electrician one is 45 minutes away, they charge $110 an hour. Electrician two is 10 minutes away. They're more expensive, 125 bucks an hour. We can go to electrician two. Why? Well, we can hang our hat on um, that, you know, when if, if, if this person's 45 minutes away, how far away are they during a snowstorm, you know, or, or some other crisis out there and we have to deliver potable water to our citizenry. We can't be waiting, you know, one, two, three hours when the other electrician can be here in 10 minutes or in a snowstorm, 20 minutes. And we can be back up and running within the hour. So you can go with that higher base quote. I always ask everybody, just, just please put um, a, a memo to file, put something in the notes in your admin systems or MSI. Um, I'm more familiar with admins, but put something in there so that when you're going through requisitions, you're able to pull it up. And when the orders are going through, like, okay, we get it. You know, and, and that kind of answers the question uh, ahead of time. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about aggregation. Um it's it's pretty common sense, but you, again, you have to make sure uh, that you're following it. And sometimes you have uh, department heads, et cetera, who like to get creative and, and work around these rules um, and can get you into trouble. So it's it's uh, there's the, the citation NJSA 40A 11-222. It's the contract year. Now, the contract year means the period 12 consecutive months following the award of a contract. So it's not calendar year. It's 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 contract year. Um, so if you awarded a, a contract on January 27th, the, the period runs through January 26, 2024. Um, so that, that's important to note. The contract year is following... 12 months consecutive following the award of the contract. But also prior. And prior, yes. I should, I, should, I should have mentioned prior as well. That's what they spent in, in, in the prior year as well. Okay, we can go to the next slide. All right, now, this, this is important. And uh, again, um, pretty self-explanatory, but you have to keep an eye on this stuff. So how do you determine aggregation? Um, when it comes to pay to play bid threshold, you know, um, there are two types there's by vendor and by commodity. Um, so vendor aggregation impacts pay to play, uh, again, during the prior 12 year, uh, prior contract year, 12 months, not calendar year. 
um, and expected to be expended during the following contract year. So you have to you have to anticipate um, what you're looking to to spend. Um, so an example, Acme during 12 months prior to the day has incurred numerous quotes and services for a total of 17,150. But it's expected during the subsequent contract year to have added quotes that will equal in numerous quotes a total in excess of 20,000. They will need to pay to play resolution depending on how we pro, pro, uh, procure more on this later. Um, and it's a, the, the other thing you have to know is that um, maybe you're not anticipating going over the threshold, but something happens during the year um, that triggers you going over the threshold. You then at that point have to comply. Um, the, the vendor aggregation is pretty easy. I mean, if you, 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 you know, in your computer system, if you just, uh, you know, you look at a vendor and you look for totals, that's that's pretty easy to, to ascertain. Um, commodity aggregation, a um, little more difficult because it's instead of a vendor, um, it's it's commodities. And um, one of the problems you run into, uh, you know, during the prior year, we had a non, non bid janitorial service for $16,000. Okay. During the past contract year, we had to call in several other janitorial services for extra cleanup, emergency cleanup, and the like. The amount of all commodity, 45000 which which means um, you have to bid it. Um, so that that's a little more um, complicated because one of the things you have to do um, with commodities, it could cross lines, different departments um, with, the, with the same commodities. So you, you have... Uh, multiple departments who are purchasing the same commodity, um, you know, tires. Now, again, uh, you know, you, you, we have your your, your uh, co-op contracts and that kind of thing. But if you if you're if if it's not covered by a, a, a contract, a co-op contract, um, you have to keep track of that. Uh, okay. So so custom fabrication. I touched upon this real quick before. Just just again, be aware of it. Elephant twenty one dash twenty. Custom uh, fabrication, okay, that falls under prevailing wage. Um, one note that this is an area that not, I don't want to say abused, it's just it's not as well known as it should be. Uh, and that is uh, a, a national co-ops, okay? We, we can't use construction. I get this all the time, and you probably do as well. Uh, we can't use it for construction, all right? It's, it's alarm systems, wiring, that sort of thing. It's it's in local finance notice 2012-10. I think I have it here, and I do. Uh, it is right under, so if you go to local finance notice 2012-10, I think it's like page eight, let's say. See how good my memory is here. <laughs> Boy, I'm good. Look at that. So uh, we have it right here on uh, page eight, and on uh, so LFN 2012-10, and that's allowing us to use you know your Omnias and your your source wells and HGACs that sort of thing. But it says right here um, limitations, okay, and it's not applicable to public works or construction contracts. The use of national co-ops uh, only applies to contracts for goods and services. It doesn't apply to public works. And again, that's uh, you know um, to construct turf. Synthetic turf, but I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with engineers on this, and 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 I'm I'm kind of the bad guy a lot of times where you know the the administrator will be like, well, why can't we do it? You know, X town did it over there. It's like, well, they're not supposed to. It is what it is. Um, so uh, install turf fields, synthetic turf, masonry fencing, roofing, indoor carpet flooring projects. That's all. That's all construction. So, um, you know, there's there's, there's nationals out there that'll say they can do it. The vendors will tell you anything. Uh, just to get, yes. they would seriously tell you anything. So just be aware, you know, you, you can't use that. Um, so uh, let me get back to the video. So like that. Uh, but there's a local finance notice out there, and that is um, uh, that's the uh, the standard of that. Okay. Um, there's a there's a brand new law. It's not a new law. It's it's brand new as of last year, last August. And again, this is probably a shocker to you. And I have to tell you, I don't think. Uh, the towns that I'm in are, are we're ready for this. Uh, it's a New Jersey wage hub. So public law 2023-164, August 16th of 2023 requires certified payrolls for public works projects be submitted online by the vendors. The law takes effect August 7th or August 16th, 2024, uh, 365 days after the, uh, the enactment. The online database is available and can be accessed from this webpage. So this is out there as well. And this is the New Jersey wage, wage hub. So um, in order to get going on this, I, I'm, I'm surprised. There's been some training from Department of Labor. I, I have gone through it already. There's telling you right there, Department of Labor. That's about the only notice I've seen. Um, so New Jersey Wed, Wage Hub is out here, and each one of your 
uh, organizations are going to have to have basically not the administrator, but whoever logs everybody in is the administrator for that site. I'm not the administrator for the towns I work in because I'm an outside contractor. So I can't I can't set this up um, as CFOs. This very likely may get dumped to you uh, or the QPA or the administrator. So it's going to it's probably going to be one of one of the three in your organization. Be aware of it. Um, and, and you know, so what, what it's do, basically asking you to is once you get that name and I have the. Um, how to use New Jersey wage out if anybody you know needs it needs it uh, you know I, I'll be happy to share it with you um but what's gonna what's gonna happen excuse me there we go um public bodies you're gonna have to submit your 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 work projects and then those contractors when they're doing certified payrolls are gonna match that con uh, max that job into your public body submittal for your you know whatever your paving job your construction job so uh, I, I was hoping that Department of Labor uh, or Treasury was going to come out with a new um, uh, local finance notice. Uh, I, I misspoke. I'm sorry. Division of Local Government Services is who issues LFMs. Uh, I was hoping that they were going to come out with a real uh, specific how-to, and they really should soon because it's June 28th. So be aware this is on the horizon, and it's uh, it's coming down the line. It might be coming quicker than we expect. Okay, and... Any questions? I believe that is where we're at. I'll be happy to, um, I don't know if my email is available, bud, as, as well as Frank's. Um, maybe we could, we could post that. I'd be happy to, you know, send send folks. Actually, I'll put it right in chat. Start to share. So, Frank, when you were talking about um, commodity ag aggregation, um, you know, when we perform audits, you know, we generally look at the vendors. Um, you know, we don't see a lot of systems where our, our clients are, have the information to aggregate by commodity. Yeah, I, but when we were testing, out there, I, you have commodity codes. <laughs> Are they in the client system? Not many. Not many. I, I I have it in about four or five towns where they want to use it, and I use the um um the uh, NIBR numbers. I forget the, what the acronym is on that, but they, we have the commodity codes uh, on them. Uh, um, like Vernon, I don't know if you're in Vernon or not. Vernon, you could run a commodity on anything. It'll pull up, you know, salting, you know, whatever. But, but, but I agree with you. And that's why I said that's a little more uh, complicated because, uh, you know, it's, it, yeah, mm -hmm. as you, as you said, when you're doing an audit and, and even the municipalities trying to keep, you know, regulate themselves, um, you know, vendor, vendors, vendors simple. You run the, you run the report, but commodities is, is, is a little bit more challenging. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I haven't done the testing myself in uh, 30 plus years. So. <laughs> you, you know, but the, the challenge there is you end users, you know, it's some, of, some of the clients, Englewood's one of my, my clients, and we really spent about six months really just trying to get the end users. It's garbage in, garbage out, or quality in, quality out. Once they get going, though, uh, and I see a couple of comments, uh, Clifton and some others uh, had mentioned it. Once you really get that those, those departments put in, it's really a nice report to see because, and it's good for budget purposes. You can see, hey, what are we spending on? You know, landscaping. What are we spending on? You know, office equipment, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, one of the um, comments. Uh, you, apparently, you can build it within Edmonds, and uh, MSI has an option to create commodity codes. So that's our presentation. We'll we'll take any questions, I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't see anything else popping up. Katie, are there any more polling questions? Yes, we can launch. Um, we had some more lighthearted polling questions. We'll <laughs> fill in. If anyone has um, any questions, like they said, before we end, please put them in the chat. And let's launch um, the third question for this session. A hand on heart. Are you wearing pajamas right now? Which I thought was a great question. And I put it in. So we'll leave it open and then share and see how honest everyone's being. <laughs> right. You might have had an answer I wish too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could expand on this all you want. Right. <laughs> all right, great. 
I'll share that. And then we did have one more poll. Um, here we go. Most people, I'm, I'm reading that as a sarcastic. <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> so uh, good. And then we had one more question we'll launch just for participation. One second. And this final question, which superpower would you like to have? I think you can only pick one here. So choose carefully. And some of you may already have one, which would be, uh, you may have to identify yourself. <laughs> Someone else wanted the I wish for the prior question also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Got a nice mix here too. Looks like we have some superheroes. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Great. Thank you, guys. Okay. I don't see any more questions or, or comments coming up, so I, I think that's about it. Thanks, Frank and Sean. As Thanks always, you guys it's are, always a pleasure. Yeah, you guys are just... always very informative, very interesting, too. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was great. Thank you. Thank so you. Katie, Thanks, Frank. Nice job. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Katie, do you have anything hey, Katie, to wrap up? Thanks. Um, yes, just before we close out, I just want to remind everyone we will share the recording from today, the presentations, as long as our presenters are comfortable, which I think they all are, and um, contact information. I know Sean and Frank seemed um, willing to have you guys contact them directly, so we'll make sure everyone's all right with that. And in the follow-up email, we'll send you guys all the presentation materials. Um, and then also the follow-up survey for credit should appear in your browser when the webinar ends. Please complete it just to indicate which type of credits you need, as well as give your feedback for our presenters and um, suggestions for discussion topics. We're always looking for your input and we appreciate it. And I think that's it. Just thank you everyone for being here and to our presenters and Bud as always. Um, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Excellent job. Great. Thanks. And thanks and everyone who posed questions or comments and thanks especially uh, Elka for participating. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bud. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.